He begins to run a Ponzi scheme from inside the prison walls. I was the undercover. What were some of the more interesting cases that you worked? Check hiding is where you open up multiple accounts right. and you begin writing worthless checks and depositing them into each account to temporarily inflate the balance on these two bank accounts. I'm here to tell you, they do not know. It's all in your mind. Just be cool and cash the checks. Born in Chicago right. in 1970. So during the course of high school, I decided I wanted to work in federal law enforcement. At the time, I was thinking either FBI, DEA, or Secret Service. And I had a chance to talk to an FBI agent that my mom sold a house to. And I said, well, what should I major in if I want to be an FBI agent? And he said, well, accounting or law? And I said, okay, well, what does that entail? And he goes, well, accounting's four years. Law would be seven years. Right. And, uh, and I hated school. I absolutely hated school. I was a very mediocre student. And uh, so I chose accounting. And I went to Clemson University down in South Carolina and majored in accounting with an eye toward being an FBI agent. I had no interest in accounting, no particular aptitude for accounting, but it was just a means to an end for me. What led you, like, like in high school, did you... You know, what led you to say, hey, that's cool? Like, do you watch a lot of Law and Order? Did you watch FBI files? Like, what? It was more, it was more fiction uh, than anything else. I was a real bookish guy. I still am, right? I read a ton of books. And so I would, you know, I'd read like adventure stories or action or mysteries, you know, and watching movies and stuff like that. And the idea of having kind of an adventurous career jumping off moving trains seemed like it would be very interesting. Of course, when I got the job, I found myself jumping <laughs> right. off way fewer locomotives than I expected, but right. it was rewarding in other ways. Um, oh gosh, was it Nelson DeMille that wrote yeah. a series of, I, I, what was the, he has a, a guy, he's actually not an FBI he's agent. He's like a Long Island cop who's sort of retired. He's retired and picked up by the FBI task force or something. He yeah, marries yeah. an FBI agent. Yeah, yeah. I, and I liked the Nelson DeMille books before that. The, yeah. uh, the His one-off series, like the Charm School and uh, the, and I think it was the- Up Country. Up Country. It was one called, was it North Coast or South Coast or Gold Coast? Yeah, yeah. Gold oh Coast. man, Gold what a great Coast. book. Yeah. And so I grew up reading that type of stuff and the idea of kind of crime and scams and catching criminals was just so attractive right. to me because the idea of sitting behind a desk for a living just wasn't. Um, I was going to say the uh, Up Country- that is probably that book. It was so good that the last 50, 40, 50 pages, I was so into it. I would close it and walk around in circles. I was upset because I knew it's ending soon. Yeah. Like huh? it was that good. I was like up, really upset. And then it was so bad that the CIA agent in it, when she would do things and he would catch her and I would have to close the book and get up and walk around. I was so upset with her. I'm like, this is fiction. Like, what are you doing? Like, this is I'm, great. Man, writer. I'm totally with you. I'm constantly chasing that dragon, right? Trying to find a book that kind of gives me that experience. And I try to probably read a hundred books a year. Mm -hmm. And so, and, uh, and I just love it when you find that book that just makes you want to stay up at late, late at night and compromise your own health and, and, yeah. and set work aside and just do nothing but read. Yeah. That's, you know, that's my passion. Well, you know, that book, like I, I ended up reading five or six other books of mm -hmm. his. It never yeah. was, we, we, they were all good. They're, they're all amazing. He's yeah. amazing. He's a great author. Um, uh, so go to college. So what happens? Like you don't just apply to the FBI. No, right. College. So I major in accounting and I find myself, and I learned it pretty well. And right. I had, and I got in, whereas in high school, I got like crappy grades in college. I got really good grades and, uh, and I didn't find accounting to be particularly difficult or challenging. It's, it's like learning a trade, right? Like, like, you know, you talk to an English major or a philosophy major, they're learning how to write and how to think and how to compose accounting. You're learning a trade. Like if I went to school for refrigerator repair. Right. And so, um, so then the problem is the FBI doesn't hire people right out of college. Right. And so they expect you to go out and get a job. And so I took the CPA exam and passed that. And I became a CPA for a big accounting firm called KPMG. And okay. uh, it's the biggest accounting firm in the world. And I was an auditor. And, uh, and I loved working there because the people were great. And, you know, you're basically locked in a room auditing for 16 hours a day with like other 23 year olds. And, but the work itself was mind numbingly boring. Now around this window of time, big accounting firms like KPMG began realizing that there's money to be made conducting white collar crime, private investigations for their clients. And so all these firms begin opening their forensic and investigative services practices. That's where you want to be. Bingo, right? Because right. this is my safety net. If I couldn't get a job with the FBI, because all those applications are like buying a lottery ticket, maybe you're going to get it, maybe you're not. I knew I could be a professional investigator working frauds and scams for KPMG and probably make a heck of a lot more money than I would as a government employee. And a lot more exciting. Yeah, I mean, compared to auditing. Right. 
So I, I bothered and I harangued and I harassed the partner who was in charge of that, um, that practice. And he began putting me on gigs and finding that I was a pretty good investigator. And so I was out there investigating frauds and scams at age 23, 24 for KPMG on behalf of clients. And, what, and this, is, this would have been in the, 90s. In the 90s, yeah, you right, again, right? Yeah, so 90, call it 93, 94. So I interviewed... Walt Pavlo uh, with uh, Enron. Who? Not Enron. No, it's not Enron. Um, I know I, I was going to get it wrong. Phone company in the 90s. Walt Pavlo's with Prisonology. You know him? Yeah, yeah. Hey, it's a friend of mine. Yeah. What was he? Who, who did he work for? Yeah, I thought it was Enron. It's not Enron? No, was, he was, um, uh, it was the MCI WorldCom. MCI. WorldCom. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I interviewed him. He's was he on your show? Are you? Have you ever you, listen? He's I love that guy. He's great. He, listen, the great thing about his story is mm-hmm. so I'd heard bits and pieces, mm-hmm. and when he sat down and told me told me the story, yeah, I went. <laughs> it was like like I thought I thought Walt had like oh we we shifted some debt. From from these books to this company, yeah. and we bankrupted the company, and that you know, like it was just accounting, kind of shifting things around. Listen, have you ever heard a story? No, I only know sh- Walt as, as the guy from. I mean, I knew he had a history, and I knew that's what drove him to doing what he can with his company, Prisonology, which kind of helps people right. be designated to the right facility. And I find that an incredibly honorable thing to do. And so <laughs> this he is straight. Listen, the first part. Well, I have Go to ahead. watch that episode. Yeah. yeah. So I only know Walt in his current life. I, I, right. I, you know, I knew that he was mixed up in that stuff, but I don't like to open old wounds, you know, with, oh, no, with people like you and him. I mean, it's, it's he it, wouldn't care. Right. I get, no, I get it, yeah. but it, we're not, we don't, we're not hang out buddies. We, he's yeah. a client. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, it, it was so funny because when he told the story, do you remember when he told the story? He, listen, he, like, I thought it was, like I said, I thought it was just, you're just shifting around numbers. Instead, what it ends up being is Walt was working collections. So he's going to these huge phone rooms where they're they're selling like you know they're selling for like a dollar you know a dollar a minute to call Haiti yeah the old phone cards right the phone card so he goes in and, and this company's this place is four million dollars behind mm-hmm. they goes in and he, he realizes there's all this shady stuff happening right with the company mm-hmm. and it's only a matter of time mm-hmm. and what he decides is. He ends up with another guy who was retired, who had also, by the way, seen what was going on and retired. So he goes to him and says, look, this is what's going on. Right. And he's like, yeah, it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad. It's definitely, at some point, I don't know how long they can juggle this. Mm -hmm. And he's like, he said, you know, though, you could probably make out pretty good on this because it's going to be chaos. And he's like, what do you mean? He said, well, we could go open a couple of Cayman Island accounts. And when you go in and these guys are $5 million behind, you can tell them, look, you don't have the five million. I'm going to shut off your your phone lines. But if you give me a million dollars, give us a million dollars, wire it to this Cayman Island account, hmm. and we'll keep and we'll keep it going for you. And we'll give you another month. Right. So let's say the guy would give him, let's say two million. He'd give MCI a million. They take a million and they're doing this for months. So they're getting, I forget whether it was five, 10, 15 million. And when he told me that, I just was like, (laughs) like, this isn't what I thought at all. Like, this is a straight scam. This isn't like, Hey, we got some creative, you know, um, um, you know, uh, creative uh, uh, bookkeeping here. No, this is like, I'm like, oh my God, Walt. And he's like, I know, I know. Yeah. But eventually it comes down to it. You know, it comes all, all comes down and they, they track him down, they grab him and Mm -hmm. um, uh, he ends up going to prison. But, yeah, I'm sorry. I just that's that's funny. Um, oh, that's funny that you that you say that. So okay, so so th- these are the types of things that you're investigating. You're, yeah, but you're, not, you're not, not that one. But I mean, yeah, we were investigating. There were some cook in the books cases, right? And uh, we were investigating some major corporate embezzlements and some kind of just frauds and swindles, inventory shrinkage, things like that. I mean, they weren't amazing cases, but it was neat. Again, for, for me as a person who's always wanted to be an investigator, being able to do that at age 23, 24 yeah. was just an honor. And um, you know, I'm flying around the country conducting investigations and and putting these cases together. Now, the end game's different, right? Because when, when you're an FBI agent, you're putting the cases together. Someone ends up in an orange jumpsuit. When you're working for KPMG, the accounting firm, it ends up with a report that gets presented to the board of directors who have to make some difficult decisions about what to do. And so the, um, the payoff wasn't all that as satisfying for someone who has this, like, thirst for justice, you know, a young guy. So it's not, so it's not, it's not quite the accountant. 
with uh, Ben uh, Ben Affleck. Yeah, I uh, Did I say Affleck. Is that right, Affleck? Whatever. Yeah, yeah I, I didn't see that. You didn't see that? I don't. It's, here's the thing. I don't really watch a lot of FBI stories or um, you know, not or, even FBI. Is it? See, see you you, you're making judgments. You don't know. Listen, this guy. This is like taking my brilliant. work home from me. He's bro. No, it's so much better. <laughs> it's so much better. Yeah. He's he's basically. Uh, is he is he autistic? Yeah, he's autistic and basically. So he. Um, Maybe he just has Asperger's. Anyway, they they would send him in. He'd go over all the books. He'd mm-hmm. come back and he'd say, "This is who's stealing from you. You know, this is what's going on. This is what the company's doing." And he would present a report just like that. And typically, he would do things like that for like you know you, you can't you can't call Arthur Anderson, mm-hmm. which I know is you know is uh is gone now, but yeah. you can't call them and have them come into the cartel. Mm-hmm. So they bring in this guy and he kind of reviews like, you know, criminal organizations is what he kind of specializes in. Right. Gets paid big, big money. Uh, anyway, it goes bad and he's got to fight it. You got to see this movie. You'd probably I'll like check it. it out. You have it's, my word. You have my word. I'll check it out. Man. And it's called The Accountant. <laughs> I understand that, but I, <laughs> I would think you would run. I, again, <laughs> I see this. spending a day investigating white collar crimes, then going home and watching fictional white collar crimes. I, it's just, it's not... It feels a little bit more like taking my work home with me. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. I hear you. I still like I still like Catch Me If You Can. Yeah, it's a fine movie. <laughs> <laughs> so 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 you you're you're doing these investigations. Yeah. How how long did were you on the forensic? Uh it, it was only like two and a half, three years. And uh, because then the FBI we were in a hiring freeze. So the FBI is always kind of subject to Congress and uh, and if when Congress decides they want to choke off the FBI, they don't hire new agents. Right. And so th- from ninety two to ninety five, I needed to find something to do because the FBI doesn't hire twenty two year old FBI agents. But uh, so I turned twenty five in nineteen ninety five and then um, the FBI hiring freeze uh, gets on you know, they lift the veil on it and I was one of the first guys getting my application. And so I yeah. entered the FBI Academy in August nineteen ninety five at the age of twenty five, which is pretty young. I was going to say for, and you've got you've got years of experience now. I mean, a couple of years, yeah, yeah, a couple of so, years. So, uh, and so you just put in your application. They just hired you. I mean, no, still- you put in your application, and you spend a year doing going through polygraph checks and intelligence tests and background checks and uh, and writing tests and panel interviews and every step of the way, the people you're going through the process with are falling by the wayside, and then eventually you're kind of the last one standing, and they give you a date to report to Quantico, Virginia, for the FBI Academy. How long was that? At the time when I went through, it was 16 weeks. You live there in Virginia, and um, and it's a mixture between like law school and boot camp. Now it's 20 weeks because they've enhanced a lot of it with the foreign counterintelligence and counterterrorism training. Uh, where were you out of initially? Well, where I applied they- through Chicago. All right, so I graduated um, Clemson, then I went to Chicago to get that job with KPMG. So I was a kind of went back to my childhood roots in Chicago and set up camp there. Okay. Chicago's got to be, there's got to be some action going on in Chicago. Oh, it's a great town to be young in, right? You know, you know, you know young with a disposable income, time. no kids living in the city. It was fantastic. Uh, so what kind of, a, what kind of cases were you working? From the FBI? Yeah. Okay. So my first case, uh, my first uh, assignment right out of the FBI was put onto a bank fraud squad. So I was investigating, you know, the six or seven ways that you can rip off banks. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and of course I came out of the academy. I'm like, you know, give me gangs, give me mafia, give me, uh, and my, my supervisor takes me aside and says, we don't hire CPAs because you're fun to be around. Right. We hire you because you might have some acumen in investigating financial crimes, right. which was a godsend because I ended up falling in love with financial crimes over the course of my life. And I really like those type of cases. And um, so yeah, so I was working bank fraud, uh, you know, from the lowest level teller in embezzlement to check kiting to mortgage fraud to um you know any way you can rob a bank without a gun i was credit working cards. those cases secret service does most of the credit card stuff we okay. kind of the fbi sort of gave away the farm with them and and gave them the credit card stuff in a in a kind of negotiated settlement so um they they get that so any uh, interesting cases? Like how does that how does that go down? I like the embezzlements. I always thought it was those are kind of more interesting cases to me where um you know, where some employee figures out how to, you know, write loans to fake, uh, fake borrowers and, uh, and they're actually receiving it. And then they begin doing loan lapping where they have to write new loans to new fictitious borrowers to pay off the old it's loans. Like a little Ponzi scheme. It is a Ponzi, but yeah. it's a, it's a loan lapping scheme. So yeah. it's, it's kind of the opposite of Ponzi, but yeah, you're robbing, you're, you're continuing to steal money to pay back the previous one. And so those were interesting, um, you know, 
vault thefts were always interesting to me. And um, what happens though, is that I, I wasn't working giant, big Enron style cases, but I was working 20, 30, 40 cases at a time and, uh, and getting good at doing these investigations. Right. They, they weren't huge cases at all. And, uh, and the one thing you got really good at is interview and interrogation because every single one of those cases, as soon as I had the evidence, I would go approach the subject and get a confession from them. And, uh, and so you became very, very good at the methods that the FBI uh, teaches to get people to confess to crimes. So if you're investigating, do they know you're investigating? And, it, you know, like, is it typically the ones you worked on, were they people in the bank or was it possibly? Well, we worked insiders and outsiders, okay. right? And so this was sort of the check fraud era, right? Where people were counterfeiting checks. They, the home computers were now a big thing. We're talking the late 90s. And uh, so people were getting home computers and printers and scanners. And there was a lot of check fraud rings happening in Chicago also. And so I preferred the insider stuff, uh, but there's there was enough outsider fraud involving check fraud that was interesting to me. So when we were dealing with physical evidence. We were lifting the fingerprints from paper checks to see whose prints were on them. And, uh, but mostly it was just following the money, right? What ha who was this person who walked into the bank to cash this counterfeit check? And there was undercover operations. And so it was a little bit of everything, but the, it, looking back on my career, I've honed my skills those first six years working high volume, kind of low impact bank fraud cases because I got very good at interviewing witnesses and I got very good at interrogating subjects because it's just that 10,000 hour rule. You do it again and again and again and you just figure out what works, what psychological maneuvers can you make to get someone to tell you the truth about something even when it's against their self-interest. So, so if you go in and you talk to someone and they already know you're investigating... Mm -hmm. What are the chances they're going to confess? I mean, the thing is, with I always think to myself, like white collar guys, yeah. like what choice do you have? Like typically, here's pictures of you in the bank, here's pictures of the ID, here's pictures of the wire transfers, here's when you open the account. Like you've got so much evidence mm -hmm. typically where it's like, what am I going to do? But, you know? I'm counting on that. Right. I'm counting on you understanding that that the evidence in this case is overwhelming. And from like a, a personal ethics perspective, I like the fact that my evidence was fairly irrefutable in these cases, right? right. Because you know my nightmare situation would be to send someone away for a crime they didn't commit, right? And but in white collar crime, that doesn't really happen because the evidence is pretty clear. And I'm going right. to make the case with or without the confession. But boy, oh boy, does that case get supercharged through the criminal justice system if I can land that confession, right? Um. So what are the chances that they confess? Does almost everybody confess and say? Well, I mean, some people choose. Me. Some people choose to invoke the right to an attorney, and at that right. point is game over. I, can, I don't get to talk to them any further, and then I just have to make the case based on the uh, you know the evidence alone. The um, but most of the time, if people are willing to talk to me, I was able to get the confession after I got good at interrogation. Okay. And then what happens later, and we can get to this as we're kind of walking through, is that I became the go-to guy for a lot of other agents. Um, when they needed to get the confession in much more difficult situations because they understood that I was a very good interrogator. But all that was built kind of in the ground working tiny little bank fraud cases. Right. How often does somebody say, I don't want to talk to you and then call you two days later? Um, I would get a call from their attorney yeah. two days later. I don't want to talk to you. I'd rather talk to an attorney. And I go, that's fine. Here's my card. Have your attorney give me a call. Do you know who you weren't going to engage? Because I knew all the defense attorneys in yeah. town. And so oftentimes I would get a call from the defense attorney and I would say, your guy's got a problem. I'd like to sit down and talk to him. Um, and he goes, well, I don't really want him talking to you. And then we get into kind of negotiating a proffer deal, which you're familiar yeah. with. For your viewers, a proffer deal is a deal where and the defendant is going to sit down and tell me what they did, but I'm not allowed to use the statements against them in court. And the reason they do that, what's in it for me is I get to understand the crime and I get to understand what happened and work one step closer to getting, getting this case resolved. What's in it for them is that their attorney can later go into court at sentencing and say, when push came to shove, my client told the truth to Agent Simon and confessed what he did you know, under the umbrella of a proffer agreement. And so it's a win-win for both. And, I, and then I got good in understanding criminals and, and pe or people who committed crimes and, and, what, and what the rationales were. So do you, do, do you ever have anybody come in and they, you know, they cooperate and you, you know, and they say, look, you know, yeah, it's me. And you say, look, I know there's four or five other people involved mm -hmm. in this. You know, I just don't know who these other guys yeah. are. And then they say, okay. And then you put a, you wire them up. All and, the time. And, and that's some, that's something that you did. Or do they bring in a, an extra team? Well, it depends what they want to talk about, right? right. If they're if they're coming, if, if let's say I, I, I caught a guy named Martin. I don't want to destroy the guy. His first name yeah. was Martin. Don't, he was doing a check-kiting scheme. 
and you know, got away with a couple hundred thousand bucks. Right. So what what is that exactly? Like what's okay, check kiting is where you open up multiple accounts right. and you begin writing worthless checks and depositing them into each account to temporarily inflate the balance on these two bank accounts. Let's say there's zero dollars and zero cents in each, but you just keep writing bouncing checks. Right. The bank accounts are artificially inflated and you keep doing it. And, uh, and the checks are bouncing along the way, but while that's happening, there's a balance in those accounts. And banks often, back in the day, less so now, would give you provisional credit for money that you deposit into your bank account. You deposit $10,000, they're gonna say, okay, we can withdraw 2,000 of that. And he keeps banging the money out. And, right. uh, and, then, and then what happens is it all collapses and both accounts end up having overdrafts in the amount of say 50,000 each. Right. And he's walked away with a ton of cash. Right, but by now he's got a chunk of money. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. even now when you do direct deposit, they give you like 400 bucks up front, right. they'll hold 800 for a couple of days till it clears. Exactly, exactly. And so that's a check kiting scheme. Banks in over the past 25 years have put in software to kind of detect check kiting. So it's, it's way less of a uh, crime than it was back in the day, but it was right. very common in the, or in the 90s. Catch this guy, Martin, on that case. Martin comes in and says, okay, listen, you got me. Um, you know, he confesses to the crime and says, but listen, I want to give you a much bigger scheme. And so he would tell me about a scheme where, you know, I used to work for this car dealership. And what this car dealership was doing is broke people would come in to buy cars who would not qualify for a loan. And we would doctor up pay stubs. We would doctor up W-2s. We would create false income for them so they could qualify for car loans that they would not otherwise get. We got the car sale. We put these people into a car they can't afford. That car is going to get repoed down the road, but we don't care at the dealership. That's not our problem. We'll get the car back and sell it on the used lot. Right. And he goes, and what we would do... When we would doctor up information, we would make it the deal bag, the file with the deal. We would write the words hokey pokey on it. And so, and it would go, and it would go in the files. And so therefore, when we were reviewing it later, for whatever reason, we just had to look for the files that said hokey pokey. And our finance department knew that this was filled with fraud. And so we sent in an undercover um, to go be a, a purchase of a car. It was a, a female agent. And she had, uh, her undercover had like, Good credit, but no, yeah, she had like good credit, but no income. Her job right. was terrible. And so they created false, they d did all this stuff, and they and she walked away with a car. The FBI bought a car. And uh, and so that gave us the probable cause to do a search warrant at this dealership. And we all we had to do was go and pick out all the files that said hokey pokey. And then we got like, you know, a couple million dollars in bad deals that ended up costing the banks and, and, and uh, you know, GMAC and lending companies a fortune. So Martin gets a deal for flipping on someone else. Right. So I got to be case agent on both cases, working Martin as a subject and then working Martin as a cooperating witness. Right. Now, if Martin had come to me and said, you know, I got a, uh, a big drug dealer or a drug, you know, importing operation from Colombia, and then at that point, I'd probably hand him off to a drug agent because I'm not a drug agent. Right, right. I was going to say, why did M Martin start doing the, the check kiting scam? To begin with, did, did you ever, did he ever say? Yeah, I mean, it's always in some extraordinary need for money, yeah. right? You know, he had his own debts or his own, you know, vices or demons or whatever. And, okay. And uh, I mean, he was a bit of a mystery because I never really had a great understanding as to his motivation, but money's often its own motivation. Yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes I would meet guys and, you know, guys who had done, you know, minor scams, especially like, and it was like, okay, but you, you knew this was like in their own name, mm -hmm. like, the bank accounts were in your name. Like you didn't even use a fake ID. You didn't use yeah. somebody else. Like, and it, it, those tended to be like like drug related or something. You know, in my opinion, just from talking to guys in prison because they were doing something that was so irrational that they knew it was going to catch up, but they just they, they knew they could get a few more months. Right. You know, and a lot of them too were like, and I figured if I got arrested and I went to jail, then I'd get clean. It was like, okay, well, it's yeah. all upside. It's I guess. Win, yeah. What were some of the more interesting? cases that you worked? We had a situation in Chicago where the uh, the first Chicago bank, which is now Chase, was just getting killed by what they call on us checks. And what that means is that a guy walks into a bank and, um, and says, I want to cash this check. The check is drawn upon Chase, but the guy who wants to cash the check doesn't have an account at Chase. Right, Chase at the, D, at the time, again, first Chicago bank, would honor that check because they're... Um, their, you know, their account holder has written a check. They do the signature comparison. The signature comparison's fine. It's a yeah. valid check, valid routing number, valid account number. It's got the name and address of the guy. Uh, the person wanting to cash the check shows his ID. No big deal. Walk away with the check for three or 4,000 bucks. They later find out that that particular check is counterfeit. 
Right. Right. Times that times hundreds and hundreds of checks scattered throughout the Chicago suburbs and uh, from different people coming in. And so it was this super anomaly. And then we begin doing an analysis on who are these people. And every single one of those people was a homeless person in this giant homeless shelter in Chicago called the Pacific Garden Missions. And so it was a real question as to what's going on here. Why are all these homeless people going to affluent suburbs and cashing counterfeit checks and, uh, you know, and the account holder doesn't know that they've been ripped off until they check their account balance and see that they're missing, that a check was clearing their account for $4,000 that they never wrote. All right. But their signatures were perfect on it, perfect facsimiles. A real mystery on our hands. So we found a guy who was kind of a common denominator, one of the check cashers, and his name was Joe. He was a ticket scalper. And Joe was the guy who, um, at the homeless shelter, who would wrangle like 100 homeless people to stand in line first back in those days when before the Bruce Springsteen tickets went on sale. So the first 100 people in line were homeless people buying the maximum amount of tickets with money that Joe would provide, and then that money would go to one of the scalpers in town. The, the okay. tickets would go to the scalpers. So Joe was a mover and shaker in the homeless community, a real entrepreneur among right. them. <laughs> right. So we grab Joe, bring him into the office, and, uh, and explain to Joe that he is in a ton of trouble for this check cashing scam. And he, and and the only way we tell Joe that he's going to not go to prison for a long, long time is to tell us the story. Right. And so Joe, Joe t- tells us a story that there's this guy named Ali, uh, A L I, uh, from a Middle Eastern fella, who um, and what he would do is he would pay money to Joe to get homeless people together because that's what he did for a living, and then who had valid ID. He would put them in the car, in his car, and Ali would drive them from bank to bank, sending them into the banks to cash these checks, these counterfeit checks. Right. And then the homeless guy would get like fifty bucks, and then like three thousand money would go of the money would go to Ali, and then he would leave, drop them off at the end of the day. So we said, okay, Joe, if this is what's happening. Um, we want you to introduce an undercover in on this operation, and uh, as you know, you're going to vouch for the guy. And I was the undercover, and so <laughs> you're the homeless guy. I'm the homeless guy, right? And so, so you know, I was young, right? I was in my 20s, so I, I grew up like two days of a beard. It was pretty lame. But the backstory is that I was just one of these like white collar guys who got addicted to pills and whose life went down the toilet and right. I was living in the homeless shelter and trying to stay clean. And, but I had a baby mama who worked at uh, Blockbuster Video on the expressway in North Avenue. And so uh, Ali was excited because he, he loved the idea of having a white guy do the scheme because there's going to be less scrutiny. Right. So we, uh, So I went out there and he introduces me on day one. Day two, Ali says he wants to pick me up. And Ali picks me up, and it was just Ali and I that day because we told Joe to beg off. And we're driving around from bank to bank, and every bank we go to, Ali is giving me a counterfeit check written to my undercover name, Tom Peters. And I would go in and cash that check. I literally went into banks and spent the whole day ripping off banks, probably ripped off banks for 40, 50,000 bucks that day, and gi- giving the money to Ali at the end of the day. And so, um, and so. And Ali was also uh, like snorting powder drugs. Uh, it turned out it was later heroin while he's driving me around. So I wasn't worried about Ali killing me. I was worried about Ali killing both of us right. on the road. He would literally say, hold the steering wheel. And I would hold the steering wheel and he'd be snorting H while we're driving down the road. And it was terrifying. Meanwhile, Ali didn't know that we had like 100 FBI agents following me around the whole time I'm under surveillance watching me rip off these banks. So I tell Ali to drive me. Ali gives me a couple hundred bucks at the end of the day. Tell him to drive me to the Blockbuster video that my baby mama worked at. And uh, and, and the we had it set up. So I, he drives, I go, drive behind the building. He asked if I was available to do this the next day. I said, yeah, absolutely. I open the door, shake his hand, walk out. But I forget to close the door. And then the FBI agents come out from behind the dumpster with the shotguns to arrest Ali. And, uh, and Ali got busted for running this check fraud scheme. The way it worked was this. Ali worked at a liquor store on a main ho- main road leading up to the affluent north suburbs of Chicago. He was happy to take checks for people driving home from work from Chicago to the suburbs for people buying their bottle of wine or bottle of gin or whatever. So he had like in his cash register on any given day the names, addresses, bank accounts, routing numbers, and, and signature facsimiles of all these affluent people who would shop at Ali's liquor store. And he was using that data to produce the counterfeit checks that he was giving to the homeless people, including myself. Okay. I was going to say, he, um, 
So if, I was going to say, when you said he had a job, I was like, what does he need a job for? But he has to maintain the job now. You need to be to able have to harvest, access, harvest that data right. to make the counterfeit checks. Yeah. Well, I bet the more money he made, the harder that job was go, to Let's go say, to. At some point, day. someone was going to be doing a trend study to figure out what do all these people have in common. And they all have checks at some point clearing Ali's um, liquor store. But we. We got the in, we had the undercover go in before they, that analysis had fully been done. Um, I had so I had a friend. I, I, have, I have a friend named Zach who ran. It's the check uh, scam where they walk in and, or where they cash the checks. Mm-hmm. He did that one. I mean, he's done it tons of times. But one time, he and his wife, same thing. They drove a guy. He said homeless guy, um, but a drug addict. Yeah. Goes in, cashes the check. He said, we were going to cash like $30,000 worth of checks that day. He was going to get like 10 grand. He walks out with this first check. It's $1,100, $800, whatever it was. Walks out, looks up, sees them sitting in the in the car and he's like oh here he is and all of a sudden he, goes, he looks both ways and starts running <laughs> he's like he was gonna make ten thousand dollars if he just waited a few hours yeah but he had 800 bucks in his hand it took off running that's funny ali gave me the speech at one point because again I, I was dressed really shabbily right. and uh, the, before i go in the first bank he's gonna go he goes tom you're going to walk in the bank and you're going to say to yourself they know they know i'm here to tell you they do not know. It's all in your mind. Just be cool and cash the checks. And then he reaches behind and he pick, picks something up and he sprays me. And I thought he was like pepper spraying me or something. Right. He was spraying me with cologne because I smelled so poorly. <laughs> he was a professional. He was a professional. And, uh, and, you know, and I hope he got the help he needed to support his <laughs> habit. Uh, and uh, I'm sure he's living a productive life somewhere now. Um. So what? So, so how I guess my, my, my yeah. point, though, for telling this kind of long-winded story is that even in the benign world of financial crimes, there was lots of opportunity to do real police work, you know, right. un- undercover work, surveillances, arrests, search warrants. And so it wasn't like, at no point was I ever using any accounting skills. At no point was I ever behind my desk kind of, you know, dealing with all that. The FBI has forensic accountants to do that. They hired the special agents to actually do special agent work. And so I loved it. It was fantastic. It was a good six years. I was going to say that I, I, you know, like, to me, I mean, that's, listen, you know, Ali, you know, he's making a nice chunk of money, mm-hmm. right? Periodically, a couple times a week, he's doing this. Yeah. But, you know, the guy who's making, you know, millions and millions and millions is that guy in the bank that's doing, you know, default swaps and, right. you know, those types of things. So, yeah. so, I mean, that's, that's in the end, that has more, I think, overall effect on the economy on every single individual. Without question. And I would have loved to have gotten those cases, but right. those cases were generally being worked out of Manhattan. Oh, okay. Right. Chicago, we were dealing with kind of retail level bank fraud. Right. Um, Which that, to me is still fun. Like, I, oh, I, I, loved, I, would, I, I loved it. I loved it. But I hear this a lot. Like, why weren't you going after the big bankers who were kind of destroying Americans' financial system? And I go, I'd love to be able to do that. But those cases were being, weren't being worked in the right. cities that I worked at the time. And I, so, I, th- I think e- even them, though, it's, God, th- those have got to be so difficult because you're talking about a bank that makes its own underwriting guidelines. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. it's, so it's hard to say, hey, you guys did this for this reason. No, we did this to get more loans. Like, no, right. you know, that's what we do. That's why all of our guidelines shift, you know, periodically. Like, yeah. we, yeah, but now you're not even asking for income or you're allowing them to do this. Well, some people are plumbers, mm-hmm. you know, they're a plumber and that plumber makes you know, $150,000 a year and he's telling the government he makes 20 and maybe he's lying to the to the IRS, but he's got 750 credit scores and he can pay his bills. Like why he deserves a house. Like he, that's, he needs to work that out with the IRS. Like, so uh, to me, those are really difficult because they have such wiggle room. That's why a lot of people like during the financial crisis, like why weren't more bankers arrested? Because they have so much wiggle room. Exactly. Exactly. And that was the downside of those cases to me. The Again, the six years on the bank fraud squad were a fantastic learning experience. I loved every minute. I would not trade it in. But my victims were really unsympathetic. Like Citibank really didn't care all that much. They didn't come and like hug me at the sentencing and thank right. you so much for doing this, right? Later in my career, if we're going to continue with my story, I get into investment fraud and Ponzi schemes where I have like little old ladies who are just wiped out. But for that first six years, I was dealing with, with big financial institutions who were victims of these frauds. And so the one thing that was missing was the satisfaction of having sympathetic victims. Listen, I love bank fraud. 
I mean, I, I would, I would hear this, you know, <laughs> I would near like near and dear to your heart. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, and I find it fascinating, yeah. you know, I, mm-hmm. I, I do find it interesting and I find it interesting. The, the, you know, the, whatever the walls or the, you know, all these protective measures that they put the security measures, uh, um, that they put up mm-hmm. and how difficult it is to get around them and how people's minds work on how to get around them, you right. know? So I, uh, you know, and then I, you know, I have a buddy named uh, uh, named Zach, uh, which I told you about. Mm-hmm. And uh, w- one of the things he did, which you know, you're probably find you know um, deplorable, but I find fascinating. He he was running a the the uh, you know a, a check you know kiting. Well, I think they, were just, they weren't even do that. They were just cashing checks. Like he had somebody in the bank counterfeit. Okay, yeah, he's counterfeiting checks. He's getting people to do them. And so one time, this guy he told the guy he said, "Listen," he said, "I, I really need to talk to. I'd love to talk to somebody in the fraud department or something." And and or maybe even the guy just approached him and said, "Hey, listen, I got a, you know, I, I think they were gay." He's like, "I got a guy I'm seeing, and he works in the fraud department." Mm-hmm. You know, and he's like, "Look," he said, "I'll tell him I'll give him a thousand dollars." just to talk to me. Wow. And he said, okay. He said, so he goes and he meets him at like a, whatever, Shoney's or something. And he gives him a grand and he says, uh, I got some questions. So he asks a bunch of questions. Like if I do this, will this work? I was like, no, no, they'll catch this right away. And this, okay. So they talk and, um, and the guy's asking him a few questions like, well, you know, who, who's ID, who are, how are you cashing these? Oh, no, no. I got a guy that makes IDs. I got this. I can do this. I can do it. So he's telling him what, well, as it wraps up, they go to leave and the guy goes, wait a second, do you have another thousand dollars on you? And he goes, yeah. And he said, give it to me. He said, I'm going to tell you something. And he goes, okay. He gives him a thousand dollars. And he says, he goes, this is something that happens in the banks, in our banks. He's in several of our branches. He said, the, the, the employees are probably involved. He said, but they never do it in their name. And he goes, okay. He said, so an employee will have a friend that has an account that whatever they've got few thousand dollars in the account. He goes, well, one day they'll go and they'll put a lot more money in the account, eight or nine thousand mm-hmm. dollars. He said, and a couple days later, they'll remove all the money. He said, they'll take their debit card, they'll drive to a, and they'll drive somewhere. He said, typically like a post office or something, and they'll run it and they'll buy eight thousand dollars worth of money orders. Right. He said, they get the money orders, then they come in the next day or a few hours later and they come in and they say, hey, you know, I need to get out five hundred dollars. And they go, you've got two hundred dollars in your account. What are you talking about? Where's my money? And they go, oh, $8,000 was removed you know, last night. And oh my gosh. So he said, we have to give them the money back. It's the Electronic Transfer Act or something. Yeah. He said, we have to give them the money back right mm-hmm. away. We can do an investigation. He goes, but we don't investigate anything under $10,000. He says, we just pay them. He said, unless it's blatant. Interesting. And so he was like- That's so, really good information for a bad guy to have, isn't right. it? Right. Yeah. And he, so he sat there. He's like, now, I don't know how you could pull this off. He goes, but talking to you- I feel like you can turn you can turn that into something. And he Zach goes, absolutely. I appreciate you telling me. Thank you. And he leaves. And I remember Zach said his wife was like, well, that was a waste of a thousand dollars. He goes, he goes, that guy just gave us the golden ticket. <laughs> so Zach was like, where do I go? Like I can make the fake IDs. He's, yeah. he's like, but I don't want to walk in. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I he's he's a a, a tall, uh, bald black guy. He's like, I'm super recognizable. Like, and he, he's out there, he goes, Where can I get guys that will do this? Mm-hmm. And so Zach went to first appearance. What's that? You know, when you get arrested. Oh, initial appearance. Initial appearance. Yeah. So he goes to, uh, he goes there, he sits in the, in the gallery or whatever. He sits there uh, and where the audience is. And he sat there, he said, I sat there for about three hours. And just as people walk by, oh, you know, this guy, burglary, not interested. This guy, not interested. This guy, oh, Second time he's been arrested for, you know, using fake credit cards. Uh, we caught him with a fake, you know, whatever. And he's like, oh, this guy, Some, write their information yeah. out. So when they got arrested, if they didn't get bond or they couldn't bond out, because a lot of them would sit there and say, well, I can't make that bond, Your Honor, can you lower it, whatever. Yeah. He would send them a letter, put money on their books, have them call him on the jail phone, tell them, listen, here's what I'm doing. Um, I'll bond you out. I'm going to go to this hotel. I'm going to give you a, leave a, a phone for you. He wasn't concerned about the jail recordings. That's what I always said. And he said, "I don't, I don't know them. They don't know me." Yeah. So I mean, they're not being listened to in real time, but they're archived for right. guys like me later. Right. right. So, um, but then again, keep in mind these guys are going to do this this scam yeah. in a different name. 
Right. And I guess the theory is his theory is that no one's going to catch on to it or, or either or, way or care much. Right. Either way, it's not going to come back to him as what he, what he felt. Yeah, now, I obviously, guess, yeah. I met him in jail. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, spoiler and, alert. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> what, ends, what ends up happening is these guys would come and they would get, go and they get their property. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of people don't realize this, but you can have someone walk in and put something in your property. You can say, hey, my brother's getting out. Uh, he's going to catch the bus. Here, he, Here's his cell phone. Can you put it in his property? And they go, sure. They, what's his name? They pull it, stick it in the bag. Yeah. So the guy gets out. He's got a phone, a little message. Maybe he's got a card for a motel down the street. He goes to the motel. He calls the, the phone number. Zach says, take a picture of yourself. Send it to me. They make IDs. They send him the IDs, put them on a plane. He flies to Iowa. He goes and opens up three or four bank. He gets like three IDs, opens three bank accounts in each ID. Zach wires money in there into the account. Mm-hmm. A couple days later, the guy gets his debit card. The guy scans the debit card, mails the, the debit cards to Zach in Florida, and they go in and buy, buy eight and nine thousand dollars worth of money orders at the post office. Bam, bam, bam. Calls the guy up and says, Hey, go in right now under this name. Here's the bank. Guy goes to the bank. It 12 minutes ago. In Florida, you know, the, the, someone removed all the money out of his account. So he goes in and says, hey, I need to get 500 bucks. And they go, you've got $12 in your account. You just took out $8,000 or $9,000. He's like, what are you talking about? Oh, well, that wasn't you? No. And they're like, oh, it was in Florida. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that couldn't have been you. Where's your debit card? I got it right here. Mm-hmm. So you go, well, you're going to have to talk to Sally. You know, goes and talk to the bank manager, Sally. Sally says, oh, my gosh, this is, this is insane. You know, okay, I don't know what happened. We'll put the money back. He said, even if they said something's not right, he goes, by law, they have to give him the money back. Right. He goes, so they give him the money back. He said they would then transfer the money back out of the account. He said, because the first few times he had some guys steal the money. Like, oh, I want it in cash now, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but this would happen. He said, everybody, all these guys that he did this with, he said, they were good for one or two. He said, but by that point, you know, we're making $90,000. They're getting... Twenty and thirty thousand dollars. He so by the second time they're going, they've got sixty thousand. He's they're no good. They're they're, they're drug addicts. They're that's whatever. the problem, right? Yeah. They falls apart. But I always thought it was a brilliant scam. And, and he, what's so funny about him is that he can tell you how many times once they got money, it would fall apart. Like mm-hmm. they'd be at a hotel he put up, put them up at the hotel manager calls and says, "Listen, this guy can't stay here." Like yeah. he's some woman's here with him. She's walking up down the hallway naked, or they've they've sold the car that they were in because he gave them not a lot of money. Crime would be a great idea if you didn't have to deal with criminals. Cri- <laughs> oh, no, they're horribly. Uh, um, I always say that with with uh, Colby. I'm like, I have to schedule seven interviews. Yeah. To get four people to show up. I know. You know, yeah. because I'm dealing, even when these guys are, even when they have regular jobs, they're just not. They have no appreciation of someone's time. Yeah. But anyway, I always thought that you know, if you remove the morality and ethics out of it who thinks i mean he put together it's a great it was a great scam he just until it wasn't until it wasn't he went to jail and he was explaining to me and i was like that's a great scam yeah you know, he's, yeah well two guys in an orange jumpsuit yeah. talking about how smart they were exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> um but he's 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 hilarious but um like he would have great questions for you to, you know what about this hey, did you ever this did, we used to do this um but yeah so Anyway, so yeah, I always find the bank fraud stuff fascinating. It, because, was, it was a good time, yeah. Right. There's so many, they put up so many walls to stop it, obviously, right. for good reason. Mm-hmm. And the ways criminals figure out how to get around them, if they can. Um, but you, but eventually you're saying you moved, you what moved ha- out of that? So what happens is I show up to work on September 11, 2001, oh. to my bank fraud squad. It's a bad day. And uh, sit down. I'm getting ready to go confront a woman for running some small bank fraud situation. And planes start flying into buildings in New York. And uh, and so everybody just hits pause on their cases and goes 24-7 trying to make sure that planes are not going to be flying into the Sears Tower. And right. so, and so it's – and then as we're kind of grinding out in the the – you know, weeks following the 9-11, just kind of running down ground balls. Every, no one's working their cases. We're working 24-7 on that stuff. Um, the, the senior management at my office began looking at, they wanted to put together kind of a, a special team. And uh, they wanted to bring like an organized crime guy together, a financial crime guy together, a, uh, you know, a counterterrorism guy together, people from the different disciplines onto kind of one team at FBI Chicago. 
And they took a look at the stats because, again, it's, it's the government. So they just took a look and see, well, there's this Tom Simon guy that no one really knew. I was kind of a quiet guy, um, you know, putting 40 to 50 people a year in prison on fraud charges. Right. And, uh, and with great relationships at the U.S. Attorney's Office, the federal prosecutors, because I was dealing with such a high volume of relatively, you know, small bank fraud cases. And she's so like, well, this is a guy who knows the system. He's well connected with the U.S. Attorney's Office. Let's put him on this team. And so they put me on this team with five agents. And the idea was this. The FBI and the CIA had identified two charities, Islamic charities, based in Chicago, who were taking money from good Muslims with the promise that that money would be going to help out the poor and needy of the Muslim world, and then funneling that money overseas to Islamic fighting groups, including Al-Qaeda. No. Shocking. (laughs) And so while this had been something that we had known about as a nation and kind of monitored and had some FISA wiretaps on before, 9-11 happens, the gloves are off. This is no longer an intelligence operation. This is a dismantlement operation. We're going to have to take these charities apart, uh, prosecute who we can prosecute, deport who we can't, and cut off the flow of blood money to terrorist groups. And so I did that for two years. We shut down these charities. And, uh, and I was like the financial guy in the team, right? It was like, you know, like an old A-team movie where everybody had their own mission. I was the financial guy looking through the bank records and trying to figure it out and going out and interviewing people, flying to Turkey, flying to Canada, flying around the world, trying to make this case to kind of build this up. And while, you know, my partners were doing that as well. And so eventually we, we do. We put some of these charity leaders in prison. We shut down the charities. We seized the money. We got terrible press for it, right? Because when you shut down charity, it doesn't sound good. Well, the Muslims they got, felt attacked, right? Yeah. They're like, well, you got to work on not saying charity. You got to say money laundering or something, right? <laughs> so exactly. Shut down two charities, right? Because again, it, what the what I think the Islamic community didn't understand is that this was a fraud case. And that's the way I always approached it. They're right. they're they're defrauding these Muslims who are doing the right thing, right? right? They have they have their version of tithing called zakat, where they have to give ten percent of their income to a charity to help out the poor and needy of the Muslim world. Their intentions were not to have this money funneled to, you know, to trigger pullers in Chechnya. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so they were being ripped off. I think we did a bad job in the PR department trying to make it clear to them that we are not, I mean, but again, Muslims were on their heels feeling attacked from all sides after 9-11 attacks, some, sometimes with validity, sometimes without. Right. And so this was just another burr in their saddle, the fact that now we're shutting down their charity and, uh, and you know, their charities that they gave money to every week or every month or once a year. And, but we did it. And so we shut them down. And so that was a great period of time. And then that was kind of mission accomplished. I wasn't really interested in being a terrorism agent. I wanted to get back to crimes. And so around that same window of time, we had a governor in Illinois named Rod Blagojevich, who was crooked as a barrel of snakes, right? This guy was super corrupt, right? So I get put on that team to try to, uh, again, with a bunch of other agents, to try to investigate the governor of Illinois. And, uh, and so we're working on it. We're hearing all sorts of stories. His whole thing was pay for play. If you wanted to go- get government contracts, you needed to pay money in donations to him in order to get those contracts. It was very kind of old school Chicago way of running it. And, uh, and he was running the entire state that way. And so we end up getting enough evidence to go up on a wiretap on him. And, uh, and so and because for bribery issues, more pay for play stuff. And How egregious are the wiretaps? Wiretaps are great, right? So we're going. We go up in, in, but wait, we're going up around election day when Barack Obama was elected the first time. So that oh eight, does that sound right? Yeah, oh uh, election November two thousand eight. And um, and so Barack Obama wins the election, and you know we basically turn on the wires. And I don't know that it even occurred to us that Governor Blagojevich, now that Barack Obama was our senator. In Illinois, All right? He's going to go be president, which leaves an open Senate seat in Illinois. Oh, that's right. He was allowed to. So the governor put someone got, there, got right? to put someone in that Senate seat by appointment, and Governor Blagojevich was treating that like a commodity to be sold to the highest bidder. I remember this. I remember watching this on CNN. Right, and so, and again, I was a small cog in that big wheel. There were better looking and smarter people who were the case agents, but I was managing the wiretap of Blagojevich's home, where most of the uh, the wheeling and dealing was happening. And so he's making deals with people. He's he's getting he's sending out emissaries to try to monetize this uh, you know, appoint, appointing right. someone to be senator. And the team would sit around talking about what kind of crisis do we have on our hands if he actually consummates this deal, 
right? This is something that the U.S. Constitution and Title 18 never even contemplated. A senator being appointed in exchange for a bribe, does he get to be senator? Do we, right. do we somehow undo that? What's the constitutional mechanism to do that? And so we ended up taking the case down before the deal was made, before he actually appointed someone. Who was the senator? It was going to be Jesse Jackson Jr. was the high bidder, um, but that um, it never happened, yeah. right? He never appointed Jesse Jackson Jr. He never accepted the bribe, which made the case very difficult to make in court later. And we were criticized for taking the case down too early, but we did that deliberately to prevent this incredible constitutional crisis and to make sure that the people of Illinois actually had representation in the Senate. That yeah. wasn't, it would have, uh, you know, we're, law enforcement's often like kind of weighing to, you know, very difficult decisions. I think even just, you know, I understand that, you know, you, you stopped it, you know, I stopped it before you had the crime, but still, you know, before the actual event, but still the, the idea that you would be a politician or be involved, you know, in politics and someone would approach you with that and you would entertain it alone that you're like, well, well again, what about this? He was soliciting but, this. Let's be clear. This right. was not him just sitting back and like having bad guys come no, in no, and I making mean, him even, offers. I'm saying even Jesse Jackson or whoever that person would have been, mm -hmm. if they, you know, if your emissary came and said, look, this is what we're doing. This is what we're interested in. Would you be, to me, you know, any ethical person in government would be like, listen, I can't be involved in that. I'll either get it on my merits or, or I won't. I'm not going to pay $300,000. Right. Like, you would think that anybody in that environment would be would be very wary, wary of that, even having the conversation like, well, what do you mean? You know, as soon as they do that, it's like right. you shouldn't even be in politics, bro. That, and that was our position as well. And uh, so Blagojevich gets, uh, you know, we arrest him on all sorts of um, charges in relating to corruption. Right. He goes to trial. He has a hung jury. One woman on the trial says, can't make a decision. And, uh, and so um, the government retries him again. At this point, I'm kind of out of it because I was mostly handling the uh, a lot of interviews in the case and the wiretap, but I'm following the story. Right. There, again, I wasn't the case agent. Uh, and uh, and so he goes to trial, guilty, gets sentenced to prison. Long time. I can't remember the, the sentence. 15 years, something like that. While he's awaiting, you'll appreciate this, while he is awaiting um, trial, either his first trial or his second trial. As you know, like the, um, if you're not a flight risk or a danger to the community, you can basically chill out at home yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and people think that you're sitting in jail, like, you know, like banging a metal cup on your bars. It, right. it, it, if you're, if you're not a flight risk or a danger to the community, you, you, you go home awaiting your trial. Yeah. He's not going, he's too recognizable. Right. He can't go anywhere. And so during that window of time, he's got financial problems, right? This was not a guy who had made himself wealthy in government. And so he goes on a TV show called Celebrity Apprentice, starring a game show host named Donald Trump. <laughs> well, he's away. And again, this is when Trump was a game show host yeah. on TV. Blagojevich goes on the show while he's awaiting trial, kind of like this weird sort of stunt casting of this, this, uh, this governor who had this cloud over his head. And, uh, and then Blagojevich, the show ends, Blagojevich goes to prison and sits in prison. While he's in prison, America decides to elect this game show host, Donald Trump, president. Right. And uh, Donald Trump ends up commuting Blagojevich's sentence and letting him out early. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah, I mean, again, I, he still I, sat there for, a, he still yeah, had to he, be there for four or five years. His right? sentence was very long and he served, I think, two thirds of it, maybe three fourths of it. And, uh, and it was a commutation, not a pardon. Right. But, and, and, you know, like Trump, hate Trump, it's none of my business. I don't care either yeah. way. But it's a guy who, who, who rewards loyalty. His whole thing is loyalty, right? right? And when he needed to cast someone on his show, Blagojevich stepped up. He was loyal to Trump and Trump repaid that loyalty with a commutation. <laughs> But meanwhile, so after the Bogoyevich case, really kind of during it, because I wasn't involved with the trial too much, I transferred to Hawaii. Okay. Well, was there, I mean, was there an opening? Did yeah. you want to go to Hawaii? Or, okay. I mean, I was sick of the cold weather. I mean, it was that simple. And I uh, had two little kids at the time. And Hawaii, so, ugh, you know, you could, you could stomach Hawaii if you had to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Hawaii is actually not a very desirable office for FBI agents to get because Why? cost of living is high. The schools are um, less than satisfactory, right. and the proximity to extended family is a big stressor for agents. So it's not a desirable office for the FBI to, and so they have to canvas every now and they say like, hey, is anyone willing to go to Hawaii? And I come home to the wife and I float the idea, fully expecting her to say, no, we're Chicago people. And right. she's like, well, that seems really cool. Yeah. And so a couple months later, we're kicking it in Hawaii. How long were you there? Seven years. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, 
what were you working there? It's got to be vastly different. It was financial crimes from the jump. Right. And so it was fantastic. I get there, very young office. By this point, I had 13 years in. And so... Um, and so it was terrific. I was a very senior agent in a office filled with like high energy new agents. And, uh, but I was the guy who had the experience. And so, and it was during the mortgage fraud uh, era where okay. we, we were, the FBI was just cranking out mortgage fraud cases again and again and again. There were two other guys working financial crimes and they were like, jump on board. We can do all these mortgage fraud cases. I didn't find mortgage fraud all that interesting because in my mind, I had sort of moved past. Do you my, think it's sexy? I think the people who do more of the fraud are, are handsome and charming and look great in black t-shirts, but, but understand where I was coming from. I had done six years in bank fraud and right. uh, I wanted to work a different kind of fraud. And so I said, listen, while you guys are doing all this mortgage fraud stuff, we have a giant stack of unanswered complaints of investment fraud, of people who are out there offering Ponzi schemes and fraudulent investments. Let me take that. You guys can do the mortgage fraud. I'll do the investment fraud. And we're just going to make a ton of cases. And uh, and these were young agents. I was happy to kind of explain to them how to shepherd a case through the system, tricks and tips. And I became a resource for the, uh, for the division, interview and interrogation, things like that. And so it was a fantastic window of time for me where I was working these, I, I got to work tons and tons of investment fraud cases with actual human beings who are victims as opposed to kind of cold hearted banks and, uh, and be the big fish in a small pond, um, you know, enjoying wearing uh, Aloha shirts every day instead of business suits and making big cases. It was fantastic. What were, uh, you want to throw out one of the cases? What? Uh, I worked a lot of major embezzlements and I worked investment fraud. Um, okay, had a case. I won't bore you with too many details because I did a whole episode of another podcast talking about this one case. But okay. you'll appreciate What episode was that? Well, I mean, what, what podcast? It was the Jerry Williams FBI uh, retired yeah. case review. We were talking about that. We love Jerry. We yeah, love she, Jerry. She's, she's great. Just, she's, she's so nice. Yeah, but when you called me to be on the show, I called Jerry and said, is this guy okay? She said, do it. Yeah. So uh, I wouldn't she's be great. here if it weren't for her. And everybody loves her too. If you read the comments. She's a delightful lady. Everybody's, you know, she, you know, they're like every time she laughs, I laugh. I can't help it. Her, you know, she's super nice, super funny. I'll give you the very short version of the long story I told on her show, and I think you'll you'll really appreciate this. Um, a, a guy goes to prison for running a Ponzi scheme. His name is Perry Griggs. He gets assigned to Lompoc in West in uh, Las Vegas. Yeah, uh, it's kind of an Air Force Base work camp. Lompoc is it's it, Lompoc in in. It's not in California? No, I'm sorry. You're right. It was, what's the one in Vegas? What's the, what's the Air Force Base in Vegas? He ended up in Lompoc later, but. Um, I don't know. Uh, I know Lompoc. I remember Pop, Lompoc. Vegas. I can't remember the name of it. Right. Hey, hey, but bottom line is he's in prison. He begins to run a Ponzi scheme from inside the prison walls, convincing the other prisoners, most of whom were from Hawaii, to get their families to get mortgages on, cash out mortgages on their family homes to invest with him and his wife while inside the Bureau of Prison so he would trade commodities for money. But the whole thing was a giant Ponzi scheme. He gets out of prison, becomes a fugitive. I need to build the case on a man who committed a multi-million dollar Ponzi scheme while inside the prison walls and then catch him after he took off and, and, and left and skipped out on his supervised release. So that was my favorite case when I worked there. I was going to say, do you go to, do you fly out and go to the prison? Are, are there still inmate? are these guys all still in prison? Uh, some, some of my victims were, but again, the real victims were not the prisoners themselves, Their but they, they would numbers. call, hey mom, I met this guy. He's this billionaire commodities trader because as you know people in prison they talk about everything but they don't often like to talk about the one thing in their life the one mistake they made that put them there to begin with it's and you could tell me if i got this wrong but it's just sort of a topic that that a lot of the people are not comfortable talking about and you could tell me if I got this wrong, but Perry's whole thing was that he creates an entire legend for himself that was fictitious. He said that he was a he was there for money laundering and he was this multi millionaire um, like commodities trader. And he didn't tell any of these guys that he was there for doing an investment fraud Ponzi scheme. Do you find that accurate? Yeah. Um, or possible? Or, I mean, I mean, it's it, what happened. I'm just it, curious if it's, it's common. No, I mean, all, often they will alter. You know, that you'll alter. The, because you can look up what someone's there for, right? Like you mm -hmm. can have your family, hey, there's this guy here, blah, blah. But that's but, more of a Title 18 charge, right? You're going to see that there's, they, they pled guilty to Title 18 wire fraud right, charges. That's what I'm but, but the story behind that maybe something. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's yeah. like you can see, hey, this guy's here for wire fraud or bank fraud. But he can alter, unless you had a ton of press, he can alter all the reasons why he ended up doing it. It can end up being like, look, I was supposed to file these forms with the government. And I'll be honest with you. Look, I didn't do it. Okay, I figured I could get away with it. It ended up, this happened. They offered me two years. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. or three years probation. I took him to trial because I thought I didn't think anybody was going to testify. I ended up getting five years. So suddenly you're like, oh man, you got screwed. Yeah. Well, you get to create your own legend, right? right? Because there's no fact checking going right. on. The, the you, truth is, you ripped off retirees for two million dollars, and right. you deserved fifty years. You got lucky and got five mm-hmm. or four. Yeah. Yeah. So Perry tells. Nellis Air Force Base was the oh, prison okay. in Vegas, which had a prison work camp. I don't think it's there anymore. Perry told everybody he was a millionaire commodities trader who uh, who got, went to prison for like some version of money laundering. The fact of the matter is he was ripping off little old ladies uh, that got him there. And then he continued to rip off little old ladies while inside the prison walls. Mm. So that was a case I just loved because the um, it was such an unusual case, especially at the beginning when my phone is ringing and I would have these grandmothers tell me that they had invested their life savings with a man sitting in federal prison. And I was like, well, what? Say that again. What do you mean? And so I loved that case. Did you track him down? Like when he disappeared? How yeah, much, he disappears. How much did he get first? How much did he get? Um, Ponzi schemes are weird, right? Because there's some returns coming back to you. And right. so it becomes a bit of a math problem. But I think he took in uh, a few million, uh, but he netted probably about one million. Okay. So, and his wife's mostly spending the money on the outside. He's sort of funding her lifestyle much more so than his because he's sitting on the inside. So, and then he takes off. Mm-hmm. How long before you guys caught up with him? Well, the first thing I need to do is get an indictment, right? So he takes off, and I'm still investigating the case, but I don't. And uh, and so there's a warrant for him for skipping out on a supervised release, but I wanted to catch him on the warrant for the fraud. So finally, we get the grand jury indictment. And now I have a warrant for his arrest, and we begin the nationwide manhunt. I put up billboards all around the city. We had co- uh, the, co- the country. We had cooperation with Clear Channel, the radio station company that's also the largest billboard company in the U.S. And so there was a picture of Perry Griggs and his wife up there on billboards around the U.S. And tips would come in. And eventually we get some tips that lead us to Kingman, Arizona. And uh, we did an undercover to catch him because he was painting houses for cash. At that point, the money had run out. Mm. He's painting houses for cash in Kingman, Arizona, using a Craigslist ad. And so we have an undercover call and tell him to come to the motel to see if he wants to paint some motel rooms. And then the FBI jumps out and catches him and we bring him in. Ah, nice. Nice. How long did that take? The whole case took about a calendar year. No, I meant to catch him. Oh, the manhunt wasn't that long. It was probably from the time I got the indictment to the time we caught him, probably 90 days. Oh, wow. Okay, that's super fast, right? Yeah, well, again, he you know, he didn't have a passport, right? So he couldn't go far, and, he, and he'd sort of burned through his money. And so, you know, he makes mm. it from- So like, he's got no fake makes ideas. Makes it from like Vegas to Arizona. It wasn't the most uh, productive, uh, you know, running scheme. Mm. Um, oh, I'm sure, and I'm sure he would have started it all up again. Once he got a little bit of capital, he probably would have started the whole thing up again. My guess is he was a very good con man. He could talk people out of their money very effectively. He, if he, and if he'd only channeled that into something productive, we'd all probably be working for him. What, what, how, what, what kind of time did he get? Here's, uh, he got a, it's a good question. For the second, his second go round, right? He got a ton of time. I'm trying to remember five, six, seven years for the million bucks. But what happened is this, because he had manipulated the prison system so well when he was inside at Nellis Air Force Base Prison, his second run when he went in, Supermax in Terre Haute. Mm. You, you could tell mm. the listeners what that means. Yeah, that's that's horrible. Like that's, uh, it depends on the Supermax, but most of them have like no contact. Like you're basically in your cell all the time. You get let out. Mm -hmm. You might get let out like twice a week, but you're basically in a cage. There's no real interaction. He was bribing Bureau of Prison and Air Force officials to get super, to get, uh, you know, he would get taken off base where the prison is to the motel to have sex with his wife and then brought back by prison guards in exchange for bribes and stuff like that. So there was a whole kind of corruption scandal happening here. And the BOP had egg on their face. The fact that he was able to do this while in theory he was incarcerated. So when he had the second go around, they weren't taking any chances with him. It was right to the supermax. Yeah. You're, you're, I was going to say you're, you're most of a lot of supermaxes too. You're like, you don't even get your mail. You have to read it on a TV screen. Yeah. You get like, no, it's, I mean, it's, it borders on cruel and unusual. I yeah. mean, the, the amount of isolation involved with those. I was going to say five years of that. Yeah. yeah. He, he, didn't, he didn't see that coming. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I interviewed a guy. Actually, I had like a uniform where half of it was a CO's uniform and half of it's an inmate's uniform. Where <laughs> it's like it's orange. A, a gimmick. Yeah. <laughs> He'd written a book. Uh, his, his, his life rights had actually been optioned by Will Smith's production company. No. It had been optioned twice. And then they they didn't option it for a third time because because of the will the whole Will Smith yeah, fiasco. Right. Gary Hayward, yeah, he was great. He but I mean he's in Rikers Island. He's bringing in drugs. Mm-hmm. He's arranging for inmates to have sex with female correctional officers. Wow! So he's That's, pimping out correctional. It's a dangerous officers. game. Yeah, it's it's um, 
you know, and, and he did that for, for years and years. And he had a gambling problem. Uh, you know, he's got, you know, obviously he's got, you know, some excuses on why he needed the money and, you know, child support and the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the stuff that he did was, uh, so I was going to say, but typically the Bureau of Prisons, I'm not saying it's, I mean, it's not state prison. Like in state prisons, yeah. the pr the guards are brutal, you mm -hmm. know, but they're dealing with brutal criminals. And then the Bureau of Prisons typically hires guys, you know, obviously some of them are, are some of them are just jerks, right? Like, like they yeah. get, they, they've got, you know. Um, you know, they're bullies and, but some of them are just there to like, just to do their job and go home. They could care sure. less. Uh, so where'd you serve your time? If you don't mind me at, at Coleman. Okay. Yeah. Coleman, which is only like an hour North of where we are right now. Maybe right. only four, really probably 45 minutes. So was it minimum security or, um, uh, I was at the medium for three years mm -hmm. and then I was at the low for like nine years, mm -hmm. you know, and I had done like a year in the U S marshals, like the holdover. Sure. Uh, but I was going to say like, typically I, you know, when I was there, it wasn't that bad as far as like people guards bringing in stuff because yeah. you know they they make decent money like they 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 make okay money. You well, know? the one thing I know about federal employees is that everyone is terrified about getting in trouble and losing their pension, right? And right. I would imagine that's even right. more intensified at a job which can at times be unpleasant in the Bureau of Prisons where you're just looking for that 20 year date and it was for you to get out and enjoy your pension and kind of move on with the second phase of your life. Well, in Coleman, I mean, I'm sorry, in, in since COVID. From what I've talked to people that have, you know, gotten out and and they've said, listen, during COVID, like guards were dying. Oh, so right. what happened is, because it was, you know, it was rampant, right? It was yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it, obviously, you know, as, it's funny, as clean as prison is, you, know, you always think it's filthy, but it's really not. It's it's very clean. Oh, yeah, and yeah, the, yeah. And the, the, the inmates are very clean. It still doesn't matter. You've got 160 guys crammed into one big room. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to get, if you, they get sick. Yeah. And the guards are getting sick. Mm -hmm. So guards are getting sick. Few of them died. And guards start retiring. And so they're bringing in younger guards. So now you're bringing in, the guys that were making $80,000 a year are being brought in and they're starting guys at 30, yeah. 35. And for $1,000 to bring in a cell phone, I'll do it. Like what do I care? I just got this job. I'm making thirty five thousand dollars a year. I'm making nothing, right. and I'm at the I'm at the beginning of possibly getting a pension in twenty years. Like, pff, give me yeah. What do you need? Yeah, give me a thousand. I'll do that. Five hundred for that. Yeah. So my buddies that are in there now, they're like, listen, it is insane how mm. many cell phones, how much, how the drugs that are in there, yeah. the and because it wasn't like that. That's interesting. When I was there, but now it's horrible. So, you know, I don't know. I know that was that time frame was prior to COVID. Um, but then the camps too, there's, it's so loose, you know, oh, yeah. you can drive around, there's no fence, you know, there's so, so few um, COs, for, there'll be 400 inmates or 300 inmates and there's like six, there's like five COs. Like this, this guy, Perry Griggs, he had like, his wife was bringing cigars to him. Yeah, he, yeah. he was, he had this whole, like he was working, he had a job inside some warehouse that was being renovated at Nellis Air Force Base. And he was living like a king there. He had a laptop with a Wi-Fi card. He had smuggled so much yeah. stuff into that prison to keep this Ponzi scheme alive that, um, that it was, it was yeah. a, a rude awakening to me because I wasn't, because after the, after, you know, one of my subjects goes to prison. It's not like I'm on their Christmas card list, right? right? I don't get to hear about what happens or what it's really like. My only exposure to prisons when I need to go in to interview somebody on a case, yeah. and so it's pretty minimal. Yeah, I was going to say, look, some of the guys like that I've known that have actually worked with the FBI or DEA or what mm -hmm. you know, they actually do call. Like they will call them and talk to them, or they'll the, the some of these FBI agents and DEA agents will put money on their books. You know, they'll mm -hmm. say. They'll call them and say, listen, man, I got no money. I'm in here. Yeah. I've got, and they're like, hey, I'm going to send you 200 bucks. You know, I, I don't know if there's a, like an account or something. They'll send them money mm -hmm. to keep them happy. The guy got us 12, you know, he busted a, you know, 12, a conspiracy of 12 people. Yeah. We put a bunch of, you know, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that that's acceptable. You're keeping contact with a guy that's probably going to get out and work for you. At well, that's the idea, right? Is right. that there's this decent budget for FBI agents to kind of cultivate and romance people who are either current or future confidential human sources. And I, uh, the folks getting out of prison are in a good position to cooperate. Yeah, I met a guy who had been in prison a couple times um, who had worked consistently with uh, an FBI agent. Um, and he... Yeah, he he was telling me he's like, oh yeah, I'll get out. He's I'll get out. I'll get back involved in something. I'll just start gathering evidence, and then I'll say, hey, and I'll bring them in. He's like, I've been doing this. He goes, and they they can put you on a payroll. They can yeah. pay you money. They can. And he's like, there's certain things they'll like, don't do this, don't do that. He's like, but pretty much you get to go out and do. You get to be a a criminal 
as long as you're gathering the information, then you go back and you look, here's what I got. And at some point they go, okay, we're going to wrap this up. Right. Or try and get to this guy. Or, I don't think the public has a good understanding of how important confidential human sources are to the FBI's mission right. and to the ag- vast number of confidential human sources working on an ongoing basis to help the FBI in our mission. Every FBI special agent is required to have confidential human sources working for them. Now, that may just be the guy on the street who's keeping an eye on a particular neighborhood and writing down license plates. Or maybe it's someone who did get in trouble, who's trying to work off a beef, or somebody who's just developed some rapport with an FBI agent providing information. And that is the uh, those people are the unsung heroes of the FBI. And the reason that the FBI is good at what they do, because they have this intelligence base. And that's not just a foreign counterintelligence base uh, involving national security stuff, but it's criminal stuff. And it's some of that information doesn't even go to FBI cases. We can package it up and give it to local police to reduce crime in a community. And so, um, I don't know, I was really good at working with confidential human sources, and I enjoyed it a lot because I understood the value of what they do. All right. Right. I, I, I cover that for you? Well, how do you find them? <laughs> you probably already arrested them. Well, again, at some point, yeah, right. It, so they are criminals. They're all not necessarily. Not all of them. Like I, I was, gonna, I was going to say, I, I, there was an article about a, a, a black girl who had been raised kind of in the projects, lower middle class. Mm-hmm. Uh, she actually had a, like a gold <clears throat> tooth, right? Yeah, very attractive. There was an article in, um, oh gosh, I, I forget one, one, whatever, one of the crime magazines, and I had read the article. And her boyfriend had been arrested. Mm-hmm. Like he was a drug dealer. Yeah. And she has no criminal background, but she'd been, he'd been arrested. And the DEA comes in. They interview everybody. Uh, he goes to trial. He loses. Well, then she goes to the DEA agent and says, I want to get my boyfriend out of prison. He gets like 10 years or 15 years. She's like, I want to work off his time, right? Mm-hmm. It's a, yeah. a third party rule 35, right? Sure. We, I've worked a bunch of those. Right. So she says, I'm going to, you know, I know a bunch of drug dealers and I've, there's this one drug dealer. He's interested in me. I can get close to him. And the agents say, look, your boyfriend, you know, he talked to the U.S. attorney, U.S. attorney comes back and says, no, guy went to trial. Yeah. He, he had every opportunity. I'm not giving him anything. And so the agent goes to her and says, look, I'm sorry. I, I what you're doing, it would have helped us. I appreciate that. There's no, but there, we're, we're not going to give him anything. And so she's ready to go. And, and, and he says, but wait a minute, we can pay you to work as a confidential informant. And she was going to college. Mm-hmm. She's on like her second year of, of going to like the university. And she's like, what do you mean? He, he says, well, let's face it. You can talk, you know, you could, you basically, you, you can talk the way you need to speak in order to convince drug dealers that you're someone who's buying drugs, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and the way she explains it, she's like, because they interviewed her, she's like, look at me. She's like, these guys see me immediately. They want to, they want to sleep with me, date me, whatever. So they're, they drop their guard. I'm absolutely not a police officer. I don't speak like a police officer. All those, they, she was able to switch, they said, which was great. They said, because if she has to go and be put on the stand, she doesn't have a record. Mm -hmm. And they're like, and she speaks perfectly well. So what they were doing with her was the DEA would fly her in, have her make half a dozen drug buys or get together, get, get you know close to somebody, get some information from him, whatever the case may be, stay for a, sometimes it was a few days, sometimes it was a week or so, and then fly her back you know to wherever she was from. Yeah. And they'd give her, she's like, you know, I get whatever it was. Three, four thousand dollars for a week's worth of work mm-hmm. helps me get through school. They end up getting, you know, busting this guy. And if they need to, I can they can put me on the stand because I don't have I have no agenda. You yeah, know, there's exactly. no but yeah, for, but the majority of these guys um are have been arrested before, right? I, I wouldn't even say that. I mean, certainly yeah. not on my uh, for the sources okay. I had. So, some were ex-cons, some were working off beefs. I found the the ones who you could recruit yourself and understand what their motivation is. Is their motivation money? Is their motivation patriotism? Are they just people who kind of get off on the cloak and dagger spy stuff? Right. And so once you can understand that, you could sort of tailor the deal to them and tailor their assignment to them. The most important thing to me was their access. Is Does this person have access to information? Or if they don't, 
don't, do they have a, a talent by being a beautiful woman or being a, a guy who's just got the gift of gab to kind of infiltrate these groups that we want to know about? It's so much easier for us to inject a confidential source into a criminal organization and get intel out of them than it is to inject an undercover FBI agent, which requires just a ton of paperwork and hurdles to jump through. I read another article, this is when I was locked up, about a guy who was working with the FBI. And he he had, been a, it, was, it was something to do with uh, money laundering, but it was for like charities, right? Yeah. And he ended up working where he would, he was, you know, uh, Muslim. He would get in with the, with different mosques and charities and organizations. And he would gather information and build like a little case. The other thing he was doing was, a lot of these, he'd infiltrate these little groups, and sometimes they were like smuggling guns yeah. and things. And the the difference is what they were paying this girl to do it, 800 bucks, 500 bucks, $200 each yeah. buy. Like it was nothing. This guy was making, he, he must have made a couple million dollars doing what he was doing. As a he, source? As a source. Wow. And it was in, the, the money that he was talking about, mm-hmm. that they were paying him to infiltrate these different, because he was in extreme danger, even during, in the article, and this was like a New York, in the New, New York Times, or New, in the New Yorker, what's the magazine? New the New Yorker, yeah. It was a big article. It was like a 30,000 um, word article, those are so long insane. articles. Yeah. But it was, the, the money, and I remember talking to my buddy Pete, who I was locked up with, uh, and and I was just like, this is insane. Yeah. Like this, he's like, that dude's in a lot of danger. He's not in the United States. Like this guy's in. He's going to like you know the United Emirates. He's going to like mm-hmm. he's he's in these other countries. He's all you know. And he's not. A, I don't think he had ever gotten in trouble. So Pete was trying to explain to me the. He goes, can you imagine how much of a budget the FBI has for, um, for uh uh. Um, terrorism. He's yeah. like, and this guy is on the inside. Like he, mm-hmm. he was putting together, and he was like, and you know, Pete was also like, look at the mass of the amount of this isn't a, a chick buying, you know, crack rocks. Yeah. These are massive, massive cases mm-hmm. that they have no chance of getting. Yeah, you know. So uh, yeah, it, it was interesting. And the guy was actually on the in the article. He was like on the run. Like mm-hmm. he, he was getting like. Three hundred fifty thousand for this, seven hundred thousand for this, you know, a few hundred thousand, and I think he was getting a piece of like some of the pie or something. I forget what he was doing. Right. But it was it was insane the numbers, and of course this is just him saying the numbers. I don't know those are really the numbers, but they were. What I remember is it was, it, it was in the millions. By when you started yeah, adding, when you it get up, into national security sources, the sky's the limit as far as the budget. Uh, yeah, I my, couldn't my, believe my, it. my fraud sources. Nobody wants to open up the bank. Uh, the wallet's too much for them. So yeah. you, a couple hundred bucks here or there. Right. So at, at what point do you? Are we? Do you want to get to retirement? Well, no. Let's say, so okay. Or, so I do seven years in uh, Hawaii. You had been thirteen and seven. That's twenty years. You're about right. You shouldn't you be retiring? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I was young. Remember, right. so you can retire once you hit age fifty and twenty years, oh. right? So I was one of the youngest agents in America when I came in at age twenty five because the average starting age, age of an agent's thirty, right? And so, and I don't want to retire at this point of the story, right? I'm having the time of my life, right? But I was going broke because Hawaii was expensive, man. I mean, right. you cannot explain how expensive it is. I was living in a in a really crummy little house. They that, don't offset that somehow. You get a cost of living adjustment, but you know, I, mean, I got two kids in Catholic school. Right. Um, the job market wasn't super robust, so my wife was choosing to raise our kids as opposed to kind of going out and like working at a hospital or something like that. And uh, you know, and so I wasn't saving any money, and so and Hawaii just kind of run its course. I was getting a little island fever. You, sometimes you hear about right. that, where you just you, you've kind of you've done every beach, you've done every hike. The weather's great, but um, you know, and, it's enough you, already. and your friends are kind of transferring out or retiring. And so I began looking, I began going around the country and auditioning on vacations and business trips, different cities about where I wanted to live next. And I found Jacksonville, Florida, and fell in love with it. And uh, and then I put in for a transfer to Jacksonville, Florida, and got it, and then uh, transferred there in 2016. Okay. To finish up my career for the last six years of my career, investigating financial crimes in Jacksonville, Florida. Again, mostly investment frauds and major embezzlements. Okay. Um, 
So anything specific about Yeah, Jacksonville I'm trying to think if there's just... any really great stories out of Jacksonville. I feel like Hawaii was sort of my heyday for great stories. I made cases, but it was it you know, they were good cases, but you know, that's the problem with like an embezzlement case. I could tell you about the false vendor scheme somebody ran to get the money, but it, it it's not really kind of edge of your seat, uh, you know, high powered, you know, big YouTube YouTube wadded stories. They're just the same and you've stories. So many of them. Yeah, it's yeah. Not... It's, it's like folding laundry. I loved it and I, I enjoyed it and I and I had an aptitude for it. And um and I'd rather do that than anything else in the world but but you know then we get then I turn okay so here's here's a I think you enjoy process stories so I turned 51 and it's two it's the beginning of 2021 mm -hmm. okay so I'm doing some math in my mind here and I'm realizing that we're coming up in 2021 on the 20th anniversary of the 9/11 attacks after the 9-11 attacks, the FBI, the CIA, the military, the intelligence community hired a ton of people, just an absolute ton of people, like a substantial portion of the workforce. All of those people in the months following um, September 11, 2021, would have their 20 years and be eligible for retirement. And I was going to be competing with all of those people for jobs and clients if I spun off, if I wanted to sit around and wait. And so I made the decision to tap out at age 51 in 2021 and retire and open up my own PI agency in Florida. Okay. And that's what I'm doing now. And, uh, and with the, and the timing of it was, you know, I felt like I had done everything I needed to do as an FBI agent. I did it for 26 years at that point, which is a long time. I had never taken a promotion in 26 years. I was nobody's boss. I was nobody's supervisor. All I wanted to do then and now is work cases and financial crimes were my thing. And so I wanted to get out there and see if I could do this again for clients. And, uh, and, but I also didn't want to wait around till I was 57, kind of more burned out, more broken down. And, you know, and then with 10,000 other people who had the exact same resume as I did out there hustling for the same clients. Okay. So, so I became a private investigator. Right. And you go and get your license. How do you get your license? Yeah. State of Florida. Um, they make it a little easier if you're former law enforcement, but you get a license. I got my license. You take a test, you take some classes. Um, there's different, you get a, a license to be a private investigator and then you get a license to open up a private investigative agency. And then you get a third license that allows you to carry a gun when you do it. And, um, and so it's a pretty regulated industry. And then I get out there and start hustling for clients. And so, um, you know, the yeah, first year I spent a lot of time leveraging my relationships with former federal prosecutors who are now working in the private sector to see if I could get jobs from them. Okay. And, uh, and that worked out fairly well. I got some pretty big clients right from the jump, you know, fraud cases, um, civil, civil cases where, you know, frauds were the cases being handled on the civil realm as opposed to the criminal realm. And they needed someone to come in and investigate the fraud and then provide expert witness testimony at a civil trial. Right. And so that my first year I did a lot of that, but I was also doing the surveillances, the cheating husbands, the cheating wives cases, uh, embezzlements here and there. And then, um, then social media caught up with me and it became a tidal wave of clients, which right. we can talk about if you Yeah. Want. I was going to say, um, cause that's how, that's how, uh, Tyler, which is, that's my booking agent. Mm -hmm. he, you know, he'll, he sent, I think he spends a lot of time on, on uh, Instagram because a ton of stuff he sends me people from Instagram. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of times he, he's, I, we, it's a constant argument. And Colby's heard this is like, it's like, how is this guy related to true crime? And he's like, yeah. he'll send me something like, look at this. So you, would you like this guy on the show? I've been talking to him. Like, okay, he's, he's rock climbing. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, no, he's amazing. He's got a bunch of followers. <laughs> and I'm like, is that a crime? Yeah. And he's like, well, I don't know, but he's got a bunch of followers. I'm like, listen, let me explain something. I'm <laughs> like, it's got to be true crime related. Yeah. You know, and uh, and then he'll say- It's in the title of the show. I, right? I know. <laughs> well, then he'll come back, he'll go, you interviewed uh, some guys about uh, UFOs. And I'm like, yeah, well, those are aliens and they're here illegally. Okay, so <laughs> I can make that leap. And so anyway, he sent me yours. Yeah. And it was just one of your, um, one of the, one of the uh, not shorts, the reels. So- well, you might have put it up as a short too, but yeah. So it was a reel, and it was you you saying, you know, whoever the guy's name was. I don't even know where you're getting these stories because you explained some guy had done this and he'd done this and this and this, and then eventually he was arrested for this. I almost feel like maybe you're are you reading um, articles or people sending you stuff because right, right. you kind of break it down real quick. It's a little bit of everything, right? right. And so 
what the genesis of this was I was spending a fortune uh, paying for ads right. on uh, Google ads, Facebook ads, Nextdoor ads. And it was bringing me clients, but kind of ticky tack, low level clients. Like, can you do a background check on the guy my daughter's dating and stuff like that? It's fine. There's, it's an honor yeah. way to make a living, but it wasn't the cases I wanted to get. And I was spending a ton marketing. And I thought, well, you know what? I have an asset. And that asset is 30 years of stories right. of investigations I've conducted and some knowledge about the world of crime and crime fighting, specifically financial crimes. And so I set up uh, social media accounts on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Facebook, of course, uh, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And, uh, and every day I would make a 90-second video uh, talking about either a case I worked, an investigative a story or a case that I thought it was interesting. And I would try to tell that story with a beginning, middle, and end in 90 seconds. And at the end, put up my firm's logo at the end and put that up there. Right. And it took off. And uh, it took off uh, pretty well on TikTok. And then it's uh, Instagram has eclipsed that. As of the day that we're recording this, I got about a quarter million followers on all these platforms if you add them all up. Right. But the important thing to me is, um, is you know, there's, I'm not a, I'm not a going to be a TV superstar, but it brings clients in the door for me, right? Yeah. It may, and even if in, being a PI is like being a realtor, you don't need one until you need one. Right. And so going door to door saying, want to buy an investigation is a bad plan. Reminding people daily through interesting content that if you ever need a private investigator who knows what he's doing in this realm, give me a call. That has been paying dividends for me. How long are people uh, hiring you for? Like, I mean, is this like, is this something where, like, if it's a cheating husband, well, is that a, like a two week? Well, it's a one off, right? I mean, you know, it, right, right. I know that's not the one. You, I'm just yeah, yeah. But like, you know, a a company has a major embezzlement, and they bring me in to investigate it and present the case to the board of directors. It's very similar to what I was doing at KPMG when I was 22, 23 years old. But I'm able to kind of work for myself. You know, a guy in Sarasota hires me because he has a safe burglary and has a million dollars in gold stolen from his safe, and the police aren't doing enough. Wants me to find out who did it. And, right. and so, so the cases are really varied and, okay. um, and I'm kind of getting away from the surveillances one, cause I don't like surveillances too. And they're really hard to do when you're alone. You're sort of hoping that the guy doesn't look in the rear view mirror and see that you've been following him for eight hours. Right. But now I have investigators who have their own firms who are very good investigators and way better at surveillance than I am that I can farm work out to. I can, I can, I can t project manage it, take in the, uh, you know, take in the client, handle all the client relations, and then subcontract the actual surveillance to a former CIA guy who's very good at surveillance, but maybe not the best businessman. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, I was going to say, not everybody's good with people either. So uh, he'd probably be better off in a, in a car by himself. Um, so I was going to say, like in a, in a bank fraud type investigation, like how long does it take? I mean, you're going to say, well, it depends. But you know, to investigate something like a um, embezzlement, like is that something right. where you get the pay, like in three days you can do it, or is it usually a week, two weeks, three weeks? Okay, well, again, banks aren't going to hire me, right? Because a bank has an internal uh, like oh, okay. investigative structure. So, well, so let's talk about let's yeah, let's talk about the small small business who uh, who gets in who gets embezzled from. You know, they're they're a false vendor scheme, very typical, where a, where an internal person at the company, usually in the accounting department, begins producing invoices for services, usually consult services or data processing services or marketing services, a, a, a entirely fake vendor and funneling those invoices into the accounting system at the small business. And so then the company then pays those bills based on the good word of this employee. Right. But that money is not going to a legitimate vendor. It's going to the employee who doctored up these false invoices. And so what um, I've kind of got a cottage industry of doing embezzlement cases, packaging them up, kind of quantifying the loss for the client. And then what I do is I package it up. And if the client wants me to, and so far they often do, hand carrying this to my former colleagues at the FBI and saying, here's a case you need to be working. Oh, okay. And so again, any citizen can call the FBI and report a fraud. The problem is most people aren't good at presenting that evidence and that story in a coherent way that the FBI is going to take interest. Yeah. That's, the, that's the service I provide to them is being that conduit between the investigation that I conduct and handing that off. And if I'm the agent at the FBI who receives that, one, I know Tom Simon's gonna to put this together well, and two, I'm gonna put that case in the front burner because it's been worked already. I can take all the credit if I'm the agent for this work that this private investigator did. All I need to do is recreate their investigation, bring it to the US Attorney's Office, and that agent looks like a hero. Right. It's a win-win for everybody. 
Right. As far as how long does it take? Anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of months, depending on how how much evidence I have and how and their willingness to provide in the the victim's willingness to kind of gather the evidence, right? Because I don't have subpoena authority anymore. Right. Um, okay. Do you ever go talk to the person that you think in that? Yeah. In that, oh, you do? No, I, I, get the, I get the confession. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I go out and do the interview and get the confession from the uh, the bad guy, and um, and it's kind of nice because they're not. I'm sort of I, they're not in custody. I have no power of arrest, yeah. and so there's no need to kind of Mirandize them or do that sort of that that kind of law enforcement dance with them. I, I'm there to hear their side of the story and understand what happened, and uh, and also see if they have an, an a ability or willingness to pay that money back. Because again, I'm working for my client now, not the government. The government's very good at putting people in orange jumpsuits. They're lousy bill collectors, mm -hmm. so the victims often never get any restitution. If I get put on the case, I'm going to try and extract as much money as possible from that bad guy before this even hits the FBI's desk. Yeah, I was gonna say, I've, I've actually been caught like in the, not really not in the middle of the scheme after I'd gotten the money and actually negotiated to pay the money back with mm -hmm. the bank. They said, look, you give us the money back, we won't contact the FBI, like just give us the money back. Yeah, Don't come around us, don't ever borrow again from us. Right. But we'll, if you just pay us back, like, I mean, obviously that's their, they have a fiduciary responsibility, mm -hmm. you know? Um, yeah. I, I mean, I've had clients make that deal and, you know, I got to grin and bear it because I'm, I'm here to serve the clients now, not, not the greater interest of the FBI. And so the, oftentimes the client's like, listen, you get that guy to pay me back. We don't have to take this to the FBI and I'll play, let's make a deal with the bad guy with that, uh, with that dangle. Um, so you're going to continue to do, uh, you're going to continue to do the the short form content. Yeah, I mean it's it's been you great. I mean it's produced a ton of clients. Do you it, like doing it? Um, I like telling stories. Okay. I like communicating. I you know I, I hope I've shown that my guy who likes to talk. And yeah, yeah. So uh, no, listen. I started. I was like went one two. Like I started shooting through them. Yeah. You know? It's gratifying. I mean, you know, it's the idea of a. a Quarter million people waiting, waking up in the morning and wanting to see what I have to say. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's gratifying, right? It, it, it plays to all the worst parts of my ego. And, anybody uh, recognize? <laughs> did anybody recognize you? I've gotten recognized three or four times in public. Once I was uh, with my wife, we were flying uh, somewhere, and the guy like looks over and goes, "Oh my God, you're Tom Simon. I watch your videos every morning." And that was kind of neat. Um, what did oh, your wife like, say? Uh, she, she rolls her eyes. <laughs> right. right. I'm constantly <laughs> telling her how incredibly famous I am, and she doesn't believe a word of it. And uh, one time, um, and this was so gratifying, my kids were there, and we were at a Florida State water polo game of all things. And uh, and some dad from another university was there, comes up and goes, I need to tell you, I watch your videos every morning. It's so nice to meet you. He was like, a, you know, a cop in Orlando or yeah. something like that. So it happens a couple of times. But, um, but you know, my, my audience, as you know, is just sort of spread out among, you know, the 8 billion people on earth. So it's not like it's clustered in my zip code. I know, but it's still pretty cool. It's neat. Like when I get re recognized, you know, they, it only really counts mm -hmm. if I'm recognized and I'm with my wife. Right. Because then I'm able to go. Huh? Huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He said I was amazing. She's like, he doesn't know you. you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. You can't be a hero in your own house. Right. But the other thing, and and, and I suspect you're getting this too, is that uh, other it opens the door to other opportunities, right? I've been hit, I've been you know contacted by different TV shows to audition. I'm yeah. uh, doing some expert uh, work for uh, for shows on Tubi and Oxygen, um, where they need that kind of talking head guy who has the ability to explain how these crimes work and uh, and shepherding them through either cases that I worked or kind of other cases. Cases that are in the news that I've taken the time to study, and, and that's produced a different revenue stream and more opportunities for exposure, which brings in more clients. So it becomes just a big feedback loop. Do you edit the videos yourself? I do, do. I'm, it, and you, you could tell my videos aren't that well edited. <laughs> well, you know, some people they they can't edit, like they'll they'll hire somebody because they don't they just don't even want to do I use it. Cap like, cut. It's it, yeah. it, again, I'm doing a 90 second video that so it's four minutes of me talking that gets condensed down to 90 seconds, and so it's no heavy lifting. Okay. And, and, you know, which is why I think it's so amazing what you're doing, because this is, becomes a, a giant endeavor producing this many multiple hour shows a week with, uh, with not a cast of thousands here. I don't right. know how you have time to do much of anything else. Well, this is, I mean, it's my full time job now, but I mean, honestly, I like, you know, this is just the easiest job. Like this is like, because I, honestly, you know, like I'm right now talking to you, the only, the only issue I have talking with you is having to kind of stay on, you know, uh, try and structure it in some way so that mm -hmm. it's a story that we're telling. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a lot of these guys, like some of the best conversations we have are they get here and we're waiting for Colby uh, to show up or, you know, we start shooting the shit and we'll have a 30 minute conversation and just, just 
about anything. Yeah. And it's amazing. And then sometimes afterwards, they'll they'll stand around for another, you know, 30 minutes or something. And we'll talk again. And that's a great conversation. Like, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm lucky because the people that are coming here and having conversations with me are not, you know, not that there's anything wrong with the average guy that, you know, went to high school, went to college, got a job, married, you know, married his, uh, you know, college, you know, girlfriend, had two kids, and now works a regular job. That's a great guy. That's like that guy, you know, those are the guys that actually make this entire country run. Mm-hmm. But he may or may not Doesn't have always make issue. for a good interview. Yeah. And yeah. and so he doesn't have a bunch of stories that you can go back and forth and, and relate to. And mm-hmm. um, so I'm lucky, you know, these guys show up. Some of the best ones, unfortunately, are the guys that are just like <laughs> – you know, they've had a horrible life. Like, they just, yeah. you know, they've been, you know, on, you know, in and out of jail. You know, they're on drugs. They're, you know, it's like this guy's outrun the cops four times. And he can tell a story. Yeah. There's some other guys who have amazing stories, but they can't tell it. Like, right. this guy doesn't have a great story. He's a drug addict. He's, you know, but he tells it great. He remembers all the funny things that happen. He mm-hmm. can, you know, and I love the guys that, like, know who they are. Yeah. Not the guys that bullshit you that everything else is somebody else's fault, but the guys that will say like, no, nah, I fucked up, bro. Like, you can't believe what I did. Like, it, like yeah. I don't know why. I don't know what I was thinking. Like, if they really know who they are, mm-hmm. those guys are great. Yeah, no, I think it's great. And so I enjoy your show. And uh, cool. and why, you know, and again, I really admire what you do here, kind of getting these stories out in kind of a long form, you know, free form dist- uh, discussion. It's, it's, it, it's, it's a testament to you and your ability to kind of make people comfortable and get information from them. So oh, I, yeah. I'm just honored to be here. Not in a position to judge anybody. Um, yeah, I was going to say, too, I, I'll, I'll talk to guys, too, and they're like, so what is it, like 30 minutes? It's like, bro, you can't, like, if you can't tell your story in 30 minutes, like, I, right. there's just no way. You've got to yeah. be able to have it kind of open-ended. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Joe Rogan's really opened the door to a long-form conversation, yeah. whereas that would have been unthinkable 10 years ago. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? I, um, I'm going to... I'm gonna, plug uh, uh lex uh, lex you know who lex friedman mm-hmm, is sure so i did his uh podcast mm-hmm. you know um like a week ago i don't it hadn't it's not out yet but we talked so i told my story you know and he jumps in every once in a while yeah and it's funny because my story is basically this is my story you know and i kind of have a you know it's a progression you tell it right mm-hmm. like you you have you seem like you have that down too you're like well okay here's how it goes and you kind of you know, we might segue off, but you got to come back because th- here's what happened next. You know, yeah. um, I don't think Lexes are like that. So I kept have I kept coming back. Yeah. So it ends up being, but because he asked questions, you know, I thought when we were done, if you said, how long do you think we've been talking? I'd say, gosh, it's got to be like three, maybe, maybe four hours. I was like, gosh, is it even four hours? That's a long time. And when we were done, he said, uh, okay, okay. He said, and he had a little, he has a little st- clock and he goes okay he said how long do you think we were we did i went i don't i don't know he goes seven hours i went seven no and he goes yeah he said we stopped twice he's like what did, <laughs> what'd you think i said oh man i said i'm so sorry he said no this is great he said oh my gosh you know is it interesting how mentally exhausting it is though you know i try and tell my wife that that yeah. the equivalent, I heard Jordan Peterson say that giving a uh, giving a one hour speech is the equivalent as far as um, anxiety. It is the same as working an eight hour day, without question. And she, well, she disagrees. She's like, no, no. Yeah, I'm no, trying to tell I, her. I, 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 I'm under a lot of stress. Yeah, I've done like three episodes of American Greed where you're filming <laughs> right. all day long, and at the end of the day, my brain is just mush because you have to be on, right? You have yeah, to be yeah. focused. I can't, you know, I'm not checking my phone. I'm not like cleaning my fingernails. I'm just, I'm thoroughly focused on this conversation. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be driving home for three hours after we get done, mm. and my brain's just going to be mush. It's probably a function it's of my age, though. It's, you're unwinding. Yeah, yeah. It's, but it's I like it, though. It's, it, it, yeah. The end product is the thing, you know, the ability to kind of have that out there. I and, did an American uh, Greed episode. Did you really? Yeah, I was we, on American Greed. You were Greed. the subject? Yeah, I was the subject. That's cool. Did, yeah, was it, wasn't it the same experience you what, had, I promise you. Was your case agent uh, also on screen for it? Um, yes, it was. Oh, gosh. Um, Andrea Peacock, she was with the Secret I, Service. I know Andrea Peacock really well. Oh, she she was she was very nice. Yeah, very we worked to, we worked cases together. Uh, she uh, wait, she left Secret Service at some point and became Treasury OIG. Okay, and, um, but yeah, she's great. I like her. Yeah, um, there was and my prosecutor at the time, which has passed away, was a uh, Gail McKenzie. I don't know her. She okay. out of Tampa? No, this was this was um, 
This was in Atlanta. Okay, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, right. Because she was regional for uh, Treasury when I knew her. Yeah, she's a good agent. Yeah, she's very polite. Very look, she's she's very much you know unlike I like I had a, the one of the FBI's I I worked not worked with uh, and several of the FBI agents that you know interviewed me or that worked on my mm-hmm. case. Um, How would like, you find them as people? Well, so, were they polite? Were they professional? So. All of the Secret Service was extremely professional. Interesting. Okay. Very, you know, like you could tell, like it's here. I'm, I'm here to do a job. Here's what I'm doing. What's going, you know, and very just polite and nice. And they were the they were the lead agents on your case, the Secret Service. Well, I had I w- had been in, indicted in like three different jurisdictions. Okay. So the Secret Service was in two of them. Interesting. The FBI was in Tampa, or okay. Middle District. So that initially the case agent was. Um, Oh gosh, uh, Candace Calderon. Don't know her. Um, and you know, Candace did not like me. You know, everybody always says, "Oh, they." Might. No, no, Candace. If you asked her to this day, she'd just say she can't stand me. I, I don't know why. Even matter of fact, uh, did she treat you poorly? Though? Oh, horribly. Really? Just, I'm so just, sorry to hear that. I usually, you know, even if you don't can't stand someone, you should have a level of professionalism. Well, you know, the the other FBI agent that I spoke with, well, and I spoke with a couple other ones, right? Mm-hmm. Well, one of them was. Um, Leslie Nelson, and she was out of uh, the FBI office in Tampa also. Mm-hmm. Super polite. Listen, when I got and When you're talking to them, is this in the context of proffers and cooperation? Yes. Or, or was it the, like during an interrogation? No, no, this was, uh, I've been caught. Okay, Like yeah. I'm done. And so this is, they're debriefing you to get information from you and, and you're cooperating with that to try to get a lesser sentence. Right, like right. Candace was like making cracks and, and comments and being rude. And it's mm-hmm. just like, like, what's your, and I mean, literally when, you know, when, my lawyer literally said on like two occasions during she she said she said there's no reason to be mean spirited about this like what what is your like, at that point, like I, I'm not stealing yeah. from old people like I I've got you know yeah. it's bank fraud like, especially at that point it's game over you know we're trying to get information right you're trying yeah you it's mm. in your best interest you know you're gonna get more with you know sugar than yeah of course so uh, yeah and and it's funny because Jerry who you know mm-hmm. uh, Jerry we, Williams yeah which we spoke about uh, on her her show she wanted to bring she wants to wanted to interview me. And bring Candace on mm-hmm. because she's interviewed Candace. Sure. And so Jerry was like, you know, oh my gosh, I'm going to talk to Candace and get you both on. I was like, Candace won't do it. And she goes, she said, oh no, no, I've interviewed her. I'm, I'm we're very close. She's she's very she's great. She'll she'll do it. She'll do it. And I said, I'm, I said you can ask. She's will you do it? I said, of course. Yeah. I said I'll do it. I have no problem. I said, listen, let Candace know. If she wants to be, you know, mean spirited and you know a, a, a jerk to me, like I, I got that coming. I got make, no make problem. for good radio. I have no problem. <laughs> like you don't have yeah. to be polite to me. Like I, I know it yeah. would be. It goes against mm-hmm. her nature. Yeah. And I only say that because the other agents that every time they mention Candace, when I or they'd say who's your original you know agent or whatever, and I would go oh Candace, or they would say oh wasn't Candace you know your original agent? I go yeah. They go what'd you think of her? Like they like laugh about it. And they're like I'm like. She was tough. They go, oh, she's a tough nut, bro. She's tough. Mm, that's interesting. She's, she has like this reputation. But Jerry goes and talked to her, came back and said, yeah, she won't do it. Interesting. And it was like, well, it, it's like I I wasn't, it's not like I did anything that was so underhanded or. Yeah, you know. Like I, I, I don't. But, farming children or something like that. Yeah, I, I don't I don't get it. But that's fine. But other than that, yeah, everybody was, you know, professional. Um you know, well, that's so, good. Cause I, cause people ask me all the time, are you, are you worried about someone you put in jail coming back to like kill you and your family? I'm like, no, because I never lied to them or about them. And I always treated them with respect. Right. And so, you know, they know what they did. They know that I never, ever lied to them or about them or, t- or testified falsely or did anything like, you know, I've never treated people poorly. In fact, that was sort of my whole thing with the interrogations is that you treat people well. You try to understand where they're coming from, try to understand how they rationalize their behavior in their own minds, and therefore they get comfortable telling you the truth. And right. so that's sort of been the whole theme of me for 30 years. So, so um um, you know, I don't know if I'm ever going to run into one of my subjects at an airport, but I don't think that they would have a bad taste in their mouth about the way I treated them. No, I can't. I can't imagine. Like I, to me, I can't imagine being upset with with anybody uh, what, that was involved in. You know, e- even Candace. If I saw Candace, I would be. If she walked up and said, "Hey, you know, hi, Mr. Cox," because I'm sure she wouldn't say Matt. Um, but if she said hi, I'd yeah. be like, "Hey, what's going on? How yeah. are you? How's it going? I, I heard you're doing this. Like, I, I know what she's doing now, and you know." Be mm-hmm. perfectly polite. But the way I look at that is like this. You know, I've owned a bunch of rental properties. Mm-hmm. And people, whenever they're like interested in in 
um, investing in rental properties. They're like, my fear, you know, my fear is that what if somebody trashes the place? And it's like, wait a minute, listen. Or like if I evict someone and they destroy the place, here's the thing about people in general. Yeah. Like they may just be a messy person. Mm-hmm. I get that. They left some stuff behind. They're they're messy. But the truth is, even when they're belligerent or, or upset that you're evicting them, you know, they'll try and maybe come up with a reason why they shouldn't have to pay or whatever. In the end, you knew you were supposed to pay a thousand dollars a month. You paid for three months. You haven't paid. I started the process. I, I followed the rules. You didn't pay. Mm-hmm. You know, you can be upset and you can be angry and you can give me a chance and you should let me this. And you said, I can't do that. I have to make a mortgage payment. I re- right. rely on rent to do that. My, mm-hmm. you know, I have to follow these rules. This is how I can get you out as quick as possible. I'm sorry. You be polite and nice, but in the end, they're not going to. And, and let's face it, anybody could destroy your place. You give me a hammer. You give me a, a $10 hammer, and I'll do $5,000 worth of damage to your place in right. about three minutes. Yeah, sure. So they don't do it. They just never do it. Mm-hmm. And because deep down, they know I owe them the money. Right. You know, and that's that's the same thing. You're a criminal. Like, like if you if you were someone who was, you know, you set somebody up for murder, and I planted evidence and everything, something like that, of course, yeah. that guy might get out. But even those people don't get out and do anything. They're just so happy to be out. Well, that's the other thing, too, is, right, they're just compounding their problems. And when I was an agent, if someone wanted to kill me, they would just get the case reassigned to some, reassigned. When I was an agent- Stop anything, Yeah, they're going to get someone smarter and better looking on the case. We're fungible. Right. I was going to, yeah, and and more diligent now because the last case agent, something happened to that guy. We're definitely getting this guy now. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, Although, it's funny, uh, I, there was a, so in, in, in Coleman- and I'll just tell you this quick story. Mm-hmm. Is that in Coleman, they have a drug program. Well, Coleman, in the federal prison, they have a drug program yeah. called, um, it's, R- it's RDAP, right? Residential, you know, whatever, addiction, you know, whatever. Um, so they put all the inmates in, in one unit, like mm-hmm. 150 guys, and then they go through like a nine-month intensive drug program. Right. Well, the people that run the program are, they're called uh, DTSs, drug treatment specialists. So what's funny is one time one of the drug treatment specialists was at home, right? Like he lives, you know, he lives somewhere in Ocala or something, not far from the prison. Mm-hmm. And one day he's driving and a guy drives by him and waves at him and recognizes, right? He realizes he's like, I think I recognize that guy. The guy turns around and is following him, beeps the horn, flashes his light. The guy drives home and then, and then he stops. He just kind of follows him because he's flying. The guy didn't pull yeah. over. The, the guy follow him. He pulls into his to his house. As soon as he pulls in, the guy gets out of his car, and the DTS gets. You know, they both get out of their car. The DTS, I want to say, pulls a gun on him Ooh. and tells him to freeze and get on the ground. And then just then, police pull up. Yeah, because he called on his cell phone. Mm-hmm. So, uh, it was a former inmate who had seen him. And when they grab the inmate, he's got his fiance and his mother in the car. Oh, he just wanted to say thank he you. He just wanted to say thank you. You changed my life. Yeah. I wanted to let you know I'm doing great. And he was so excited to see him. He's like, "This was my DTS. This guy really helped me." And that, but the, you know, he was concerned. Like he was like, "Oh my gosh, what you know? What's going to happen? What's this guy going to do? Like whatever." I, I don't know. I I, I was wondered to me because to me, I I think I would have pulled over and been like, "Hey." Because I don't, because I don't treat people so badly that I think yeah. they're going to harm me. Right. So I wonder. I just, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they're told to be weird. Yeah. I mean, I think. Yeah. I'm sure. You only need to hear one or two nightmare stories, right, before your head's on a swivel and uh, yeah, and your hands on your hip and your gun holster, you know. And so I get it. I, you know, I in Hawaii it was a more insular community, and so you know I'd have investigations upon people whose kids went to school with my kids and mm. stuff like that, and so that was never fun. Mm. Um. So, what are you gonna do? We we talked about earlier. You're gonna you you're uh you've got the um uh you've got the agency going. Mm-hmm. You got the social media going. My social media empire. Yeah, <laughs> and you you have to you have to start doing you have to start doing because we talked about this earlier. You, know, you got to start doing you do something uh, like uh I like know. what 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 um Jerry's doing. Jerry could give you her whole list of guys to call, and you could interview them. Right, but the question is, what do I want to do for a living? And this is where I'm going to have to do some soul searching. Right? Do I want to be Tom, the storytelling former agent, or do I want to be an active private investigator working cases for clients? And uh, and so the idea of taking up 
any more of my time not working cases for clients, but like working on like a, a beautiful YouTube show on a set like this, there's just an opportunity cost to that. And, well, uh, and I still need to make a living. And so I'm not, con- I'm not so convinced. So right now, the social media thing is a side hustle. They're infomercials telling to explain to people that I'm a credible investigator. And yeah. if you need a credible investigator who's not going to rip you off in this slimy industry I'm in, you could call me right. and I'll be able to help you solve your problems and answer these questions in your life that you want answered. And I like that. But flipping the script and making the investigation sort of a side dish and the media thing my main hustle is just not where I am at this point. If Discovery Channel or True TV or someone wants to come and offer me like a big money show, I'm happy to have that conversation with them. But the the DIY version that you're doing, while I respect it, I don't think it's for me. I, I'd much rather be a guest on great shows like this than actually have to spend a ton of time like you know, interviewing people and editing it and building a set and doing all that. Cause then I'm just not investigating and I'm an investigator. Right. Well, I was going to say, um, on a side note, just to think about it, cause we had this conversation, uh, is that, you know, you don't have to have a set like this. Like Jerry does all audio, but, yeah. um, you could always do like we use, I do stream yards. Right. Mm-hmm. And you know, you, you would say, ah, those, you know, they're not, they're not really, you know, that engaging. Like, and, and you're right. They get less views, but, the cost is nothing. It's a couple hundred it. bucks. It, you know? To me, it's the time. Yeah, and, but you could do you could do one you do one hour to two hour podcast and put it up once and see what happens with because the combination of those two see what happens with your YouTube. I mean, obviously, you're gonna do it. I'm just saying. I'll never yeah. say never to the you idea. Never know. And uh, and but right now, I'm still kind of jazzed on investigating and helping clients. That's still what kind of gets me up in the morning. And uh, I, and I so I hear you. the fact that I may have a, a public profile on Instagram and, and TikTok is, is wonderful. I like it. It's gratifying. It feeds my ego, but it's a means to an end for me. And the and the ends for me is being able to work cases for clients. All right. So. So you're, one, not gonna, you're not going to get any competition from me. You're going to corner no, the market sorry, on white collar I, crime, listen, true crime podcast. The pie, I'm a big believer, and there's plenty of pie for everybody. <laughs> you're, you know? a, you're a benevolent fellow. Yeah, there's some people that like if you've got if you're getting a piece of the pie, well, you're taking out of my potential pie. No, the pie's huge. No, I got it. The rising tide lifts all exactly, boats. Exactly, exactly. I'm going to say I have one my one more question, which is you know, which is who killed Epstein? No, um, but. <laughs> You know, have you ever heard? I mean, come on, you know the, the whole conspiracy. Yeah, yeah, and I think you, above all people, know how difficult it would be to get inside I've a maximum that, security I've bureau prison. Over, listen, but you're not going to be able to convince the conspiracy theorists either way, so it's not a good use of our oxygen. I know, I watch these videos, and I've watched the videos where I've been like, and listen, like there's so many things that went wrong, but I'm thinking, and I did this on Danny's podcast. Danny was asking me this, yeah. and I was like... The, he was like, yeah, oh, it's pretty co- the coincidence that the camera stopped working. I'm like, half those cameras don't work. Right, exactly. Like, you, and this guy fell asleep. They sleep all the time. I know. Like, so do you people have any idea how People who are unfamiliar with the Bureau of Prisons connect all these dots, but anyone who's been inside the Bureau of Prisons knows the gauntlet you have to run through to get in there for any reason. Right. And, uh, and so is it believable that a guy fell asleep and the camera wasn't working? That's no problem. Is yeah. it believable that... Two guards or corrections officers are going to sacrifice their sweet, sweet pension by allowing something illegal to happen under their watch while they turn their heads the other way. Don't buy it for a second. These guys live for their pensions. Right. So I I don't know anything about the case. I intentionally don't follow it because I feel the people who are obsessed with Epstein are the most irritating people on planet Earth. Well, they're not. But they're not going to be convinced. And yeah, and you're not going to win them over. And they're hearing voices and they're fillings, and they love the conspiracies. And I have zero patience for them. But you know, and I know the truth about how difficult it is to get inside a Bureau of Prisons facility, and the fact that the guard's not going to um, do anything that crazy. To me, to me, it's the, it's the same thing as the the flat earthers. You can't convince them. Right, they're so, insane. Exactly. So, so, uh, so arguing with logic is irrelevant. That's why I don't argue politics. It's right. uh, it, I'm you know I'm 54 years old. I'm, I'm not going to live forever. I want to spend my time doing uh, talking about other stuff. <laughs> okay. If any of your viewers wanted to follow me to see my 90 second stories every day, it, it's at Simon Investigations. My last name is Simon. Uh, Simon Investigations. Probably TikTok or Instagram are going to be the best ways to do that. Um, Hey, so I appreciate you guys watching the interview. If you liked it, do me a favor and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you get notified of videos like this. Also, please consider joining my Patreon. And we're going to leave all of Simon's links to Instagram and TikTok and his YouTube channel in the description box. So you can just click on it and shoot you right over there. I really appreciate you guys watching. Thank you very much. See ya. really amazing how, you know, 
shoddy this whole thing is, and then it looks great. It looks on fantastic. You. Whoa!